51 Heroines for My Daughter Dedicated to My Daughter Gurinder Ricky Singh Dedication I dedicate this book to my daughter, Saj Kaur. There is no person closer to a father than his daughter. The affection and love that a father feels for his daughter are immense. The sense of responsibility, watching her grow, and trying to make sure that I can do the best I can for my daughter, Saj, is always in the forefront of my mind. There is a profound connection between me and Saj. For all fathers, daughters are like their princesses. Saj is my firstborn child and has special needs. She has shown me that one does not need to have everything perfect in life to be happy. To make others smile, one can do that despite limitations in life. Saj is always smiling, and her smile is truly contagious. She brings great happiness to others in just a moment without uttering one word. Her heart speaks, her smile speaks, and most importantly, her presence speaks. Saj changes the mood of others and uplifts them in an instant. She possesses such power in her smile and I realize that it's her greatest asset. There can be no better medicine than to see another person smile and be happy. These are some of the reasons why I have dedicated this book to Saj. This book is also written as an inspiration for all daughters and all teenagers in general to gain inspiration from 51 individuals who have made great contributions to society with their accomplishments. In the case of my daughter, she has quadriplegic cerebral palsy, which affects all her extremities. In simple words, she needs help with all daily functions, i.e., food, clothing, moving around, medications, etc., she needs assistance in every facet of life. There are so many advances in assisting disabled individuals and I offer my respects to all organizations, pioneers, and others who have advocated for the rights of the disabled. With great love and adoration for my daughter and with the hope that anyone reading this book will be inspired to follow one's passion and make good contributions to this world, I dedicate this book to Saj Kaur. Acknowledgements Behind every successful person, there is usually a team headed by a woman. A woman who has decided to give up everything and focus solely on the success of her partner's dreams. Something very similar has happened in my case too. I also have a team of friends and family to keep me grounded and focused. At the top of the team is my wife, Manjeet Kaur. She has from a very early point been my biggest supporter and cheerleader. Without her unstinting love, belief, and passion, this book nor anything else in my life would have been possible. This one's for you, my love. I also want to express my sincere respect for all the people featured in this book. They are truly extraordinary beings who have used their time, energy, motivation, vision, and strength for human progress. The impact of everyone featured in this book cannot be adequately expressed given the far-reaching effects of their contributions. I also want to take special notice of my many family members and friends who have always given their best wishes, guidance, and affection in all my endeavors. Their affection towards me is always motivating me for self-improvement, self-discovery, and living a dynamic life. Finally, I want to express my affection and respect for my parents, S. Dalbir Singh, father, Prem Kaur, mother. They are certainly the foundation of my life. My father was deeply devoted to the family, working countless hours trying to fulfill our needs and wants. He went far above and beyond his financial capacity in terms of providing for our future. In complementing his hard work and dedication, my mother's unwavering focus was on the overall development of her children. I will forever be eternally grateful to my parents for giving me very important values and their constant love. Preface Dear readers, From an average person's point of view, the achievements of my father are astounding. From my point of view, I see the blood, sweat, tears and countless hours of training put into these achievements. I am constantly amazed by his determination and drive. My father's preparation skills are truly noteworthy, as he will prepare for extended periods to ensure he achieves his goals. He will exhaust every resource available to get the best possible result while reducing the probability of injury. His accomplishment of major goals, like summiting Mount Everest, is a testament to the fact that he makes the best use of time, resources, guidance, and keeping attention to not getting injured. Some of my father's accomplishments include, running 50 marathons in 50 states, climbing Mount Everest, running 135 miles in Brazil, crew for a 135-mile race in Death Valley, running on multiple occasions for 24 hours, and long-distance running such as a 100-miler, countless other ultras, and running multiple successful businesses simultaneously while being a great father and still having time for his family and friends. What more could anyone ask for in a father? While he was preparing for Mount Everest, he went to Nepal five times to train. Even on single trips to Nepal, he would climb and descend multiple times to obtain the proper acclimation to the altitude, going slightly higher each time. Although this was financially a bit more expensive, this was the safest possible way to summit Mount Everest and minimize the risk of serious injury. 
In preparation for his 135-mile race in Brazil, the first thing he did was get in contact with others who had run the race. He spoke to them at length regarding training, timing, etc. He experimented with many different approaches such as taping his feet, getting special shoes, modifying his running schedule, etc., until he formulated the best approach to completing the 135-mile run. After determining the best total approach, which includes diet, speed of running, shoes, timing, etc., he started systematic preparation and trained with great consistency. I have seen this extraordinary consistency and thus, he is truly one of the most determined individuals. He will do whatever he needs to do to develop himself and with equal importance, the people around him. After completing most of the items on his bucket list, he recently has started writing books on diverse topics. His journey continues with a deep desire to help others grow by sharing his knowledge, experiences, and interesting perspectives on many relevant topics. These topics include financial power, running, climbing, and a plethora of many other areas. His mission is to help as many people as possible by reaching out to them using a variety of means. To that effect, this book is about 51 extraordinary individuals that have helped shape the world in countless ways. Their lives and ideas can be of great guidance to youth everywhere. The younger generation certainly needs the best guidance, and this book can provide it in a truly straightforward way. I am truly impressed with my father's dedication, and I also express my love and respect for him in this preface. Udaver Singh Rosa Parks You must never be fearful about what you are doing when it is right. Rosa Louise Macaulay Parks, February 4, 1913, October 24, 2005, was an African-American activist in the civil rights movement best known for her pivotal role in the Montgomery bus boycott. The United States Congress has honored her as the First Lady of Civil Rights and the mother of the Freedom Movement. On December 1, 1955, in Montgomery, Alabama, Parks rejected bus driver James F. Blake's order to vacate a row of four seats in the colored section in favor of a white passenger, once the white section was filled. Parks was not the first person to resist bus segregation, but the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, NAACP, believed that she was the best candidate for seeing through a court challenge after her arrest for civil disobedience in violating Alabama segregation laws, and she helped inspire the black community to boycott the Montgomery buses for over a year. Each person must live their life as a model for others. Rosa Parks I would like to be remembered as a person who wanted to be free. So other people would also be free. Rosa Parks Interesting facts. Did you know? When Rosa Parks refused to give up her bus seat in 1955, it wasn't the first time she'd clashed with driver James Blake. Parks stepped onto his very crowded bus on a chilly day 12 years earlier, paid her fare at the front, then resisted the rule in place for black people to disembark and re-enter through the back door. She stood her ground until Blake pulled her coat sleeve, enraged, to demand her cooperation. Parks left the bus rather than give in. On Thursday, December 1, 1955, the 42-year-old Rosa Parks was commuting home from a long day of work at the Montgomery Fair Department store by bus. Black residents of Montgomery often avoided municipal buses if possible because they found the Negroes in back policy so demeaning. Nonetheless, 70% or more riders on a typical day were black, and on this day Rosa Parks was one of them. How many times did Rosa Parks go to jail? Rosa Parks went to jail twice. On December 1, 1955, Rosa Parks was arrested for disorderly conduct and violation of a Montgomery, Alabama segregation code, and she spent only a few hours in jail, before being bailed out by Edgar Nixon and Clifford and Virginia Doerr. During the weekend, the Women's Political Council was the first to suggest a bus boycott, to start on Monday December 5, the day of her trial, the result was a 381-day boycott of Montgomery's buses. In February of 1956, a grand jury in Alabama indicted Rosa Parks and 114 others for violating a state law against organizing a boycott, and she was arrested on February 22, 1956. Her arrest pictures were captured by the print media this time, but many, often, confuse those pictures as the first arrest. I knew someone had to take the first step and I made up my mind not to move. Rosa Parks, accomplishment isn't final, and failure isn't disastrous, what matters is the determination to keep going. Ricky Singh Michelle Obama We need to do a better job of putting ourselves higher on our own to-do list. Michelle La Vaughn Robinson Obama, born January 17, 1964, is an American attorney and author who served as the First Lady of the United States from 2009 to 2017. She was the first African-American woman to serve in this position. She is the wife of former U.S. President Barack Obama. Raised on the south side of Chicago, 
Illinois, Obama is a graduate of Princeton University and Harvard Law School. In her early legal career, she worked at the law firm Sidley Austin where she met Barack Obama. She subsequently worked in nonprofits and as the Associate Dean of Student Services at the University of Chicago as well as the Vice President for Community and External Affairs of the University of Chicago Medical Center. Michelle married Barack in 1992, and together they have two daughters. Obama campaigned for her husband's presidential bid throughout 2007 and 2008, delivering a keynote address at the 2008 Democratic National Convention. She has subsequently delivered acclaimed speeches at 2012, 2016, and 2020 conventions. I have learned that as long as I hold fast to my beliefs and values, and follow my moral compass, then the only expectations I need to live up to are my own. Michelle Obama Through my education, I didn't just develop skills, I didn't just develop the ability to learn, but I developed confidence. Michelle Obama Interesting facts. Growing up, Michelle's family did not have much money and lived in a one-bedroom apartment. Michelle and Craig had to sleep in the living room with a sheet to divide the room. What was Michelle Obama's initiative? Let's move. Was a public health campaign in the United States led by then First Lady, Michelle Obama. The campaign aimed to reduce childhood obesity and encourage a healthy lifestyle in children. Michelle's parents knew that education was the key to helping their children succeed in life. Determined to ensure her children had a good future, Michelle's mother taught her and Craig how to read and write by the age of. Michelle Obama says that she hates the question, what do you want to be when you grow up? She explains that the question assumes that one day, you will become something, and when you stop growing as a person. She loved the idea that she can continue to learn, grow, and change for the rest of her life. In 2005, she became the vice president of the University of Chicago Medical Center. Michelle took little four-year-old Sasha to the job interview with her, since there was no one to babysit at the time. Michelle was able to increase the number of volunteers at the hospital by 500%. I want kids to know, don't wait for somebody to come along and tell you you're special. Because that may never happen, Michelle Obama, success does not happen by chance. Consistency, hard work, learning, studying, sacrifice, and, most importantly, an enthusiasm for what you are doing or learning to do are all required. Ricky Singh Margaret Thatcher The younger generation doesn't want equality and regimentation, but an opportunity to shape their world while showing compassion to those in real need. Margaret Hilda Thatcher, Baroness Thatcher, October 13, 1925, April 8, 2013, was Prime Minister of the United Kingdom from 1979 to 1990 and leader of the Conservative Party from 1975 to 1990. The longest-serving British Prime Minister of the 20th century, she was the first woman to hold that office. A Soviet journalist dubbed her the Iron Lady, a nickname that became associated with her uncompromising politics and leadership style. As Prime Minister, she implemented policies that became known as Thatcherism. Thatcher studied chemistry at Somerville College, Oxford, and worked briefly as a research chemist, before becoming a barrister. She was elected Member of Parliament for Finchley in 1959. Edward Heath appointed her Secretary of State for Education and Science in his 1970-1974 government. In 1975, she defeated Heath in the Conservative Party leadership election to become leader of the opposition, the first woman to lead a major political party in the United Kingdom. I love argument, I love debate. I don't expect anyone just to sit there and agree with me, that's not their job, Margaret Thatcher. To me, consensus seems to be the process of abandoning all beliefs, principles, values, and policies. So, it is something in which no one believes and to which no one objects. Margaret Thatcher Interesting facts. Born Margaret Hilda Roberts, the future Prime Minister was the daughter of a grocer and local alderman who later became Mayor of Grantham, England. The cramped apartment above her father's corner store in which Thatcher grew up lacked running water, central heating, and even an indoor toilet. After the Conservatives gained power in 1970, Thatcher was appointed Secretary of Education. In an attempt to cut spending, the Treasury ended a 1940s-era program providing milk, free of charge, at schools to children ages 7 to 11. The preceding Labour government had ended a similar program for older children with little controversy, but the same could not be said for Thatcher. The press and Labour politicians were brutal to Thatcher, painting her as a cold-hearted miser stealing milk from children. In public hearings, Labour PMs called Thatcher the meanest and vicious member of a thoroughly discredited government and a reactionary cavewoman. The Sun asked in a headline, Is Mrs. Thatcher even human? Thatcher, Thatcher, milk snatcher was one of the kinder taunts to come from the streets and pubs. Although she allowed free milk deliveries for malnourished schoolchildren who were prescribed it, 
Thatcher did not budge from her position. Internally, however, she was unnerved by the personal nature of the insults and considered quitting politics. In her autobiography, The Path to Power, she reflected that she had made a miscalculation. I learned a valuable lesson. I had incurred the maximum of political odium for the minimum of political benefit. There will not be a woman prime minister in my lifetime, she told the Finchley Press in 1970. The male population is too prejudiced. Five years later, she supplanted former Prime Minister Edward Heath as Conservative leader, becoming the first woman to head a major British political party, and in 1979 she proved herself wrong by gaining the keys to 10 Downing Street. I do not know anyone who has gotten to the top without hard work. That is the recipe. It will not always get you to the top, but it will get you pretty near. Margaret Thatcher A genuine leader does not conform to the status quo. The status quo is transformed by the vision and focused actions of a true leader. Ricky Singh Diana, Princess of Wales Anywhere I see suffering, that is where I want to be, doing what I can. Diana, Princess of Wales, born Diana Frances Spencer, July 1, 1961, August 31, 1997, was a member of the British royal family. She was the first wife of Charles, Prince of Wales, the heir apparent to the British throne, and mother of Prince William and Prince Harry. Diana's activism and glamour made her an international icon and earned her enduring popularity as well as unprecedented public scrutiny, exacerbated by her tumultuous private life. They say it is better to be poor and happy than rich and miserable, but how about a compromise like moderately rich and just moody? Princess Diana Every one of us needs to show how much we care for each other and, in the process, care for ourselves. Princess Diana Interesting facts Princess Diana fell in love with a royal protection officer. The princess said she was deeply in love with Barry Manicky while he was a metropolitan police officer tasked with providing her security. The princess said she was deeply in love with Barry Manicky while he was a metropolitan police officer tasked with providing her security. However, he died in a car crash on May 14, 1987, seven months after he was moved off royalty protection duties after their close relationship was exposed. Diana was already a lady before she married Charles. The princess was born into a British aristocratic family, the Spencers, and had the title Lady Diana Spencer before she married. Diana and Charles got engaged after meeting 13 times. Diana and Charles had a rapid courtship and met only a handful of times before getting engaged. In speech coaching tapes included in the documentary Diana, in her own words, the princess said, we met 13 times and we got married. I was brought up in the sense that when you got engaged to someone you love them. Diana helped change attitudes towards HIV and AIDS. Diana took the hand of an HIV-positive man at London Middlesex Hospital without gloves on at a time when many feared incorrectly that the virus could pass through skin contact. The greatest problem in the world today is intolerance. Everyone is so intolerant of each other. Princess Diana Using one's position of fame to help those suffering is one's true glory. Ricky Singh Amelia Earhart Amelia stars two-time Academy Award winner Hilary Swank as Amelia Earhart, the legendary aviatrix. Also featuring Richard Gere and Ewan McGregor. Directed by Mira Nair. Amelia Mary Earhart born July 24, 1897, disappeared July 2, 1937, declared dead January 5, 1939, was an American aviation pioneer and author. Earhart was the first female aviator to fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean. She set many other records, was one of the first aviators to promote commercial air travel, wrote best-selling books about her flying experiences, and was instrumental in the formation of the 99s, an organization for female pilots. The most difficult thing is the decision to act, the rest is merely tenacity. The fears are paper tigers. You can do anything you decide to do. You can act to change and control your life, and the procedure, the process is its own reward, Amelia Earhart. The more one does and sees and feels, the more one is able to do, and the more genuine may be one's appreciation of fundamental things like home, love, and understanding companionship. Amelia Earhart Interesting Facts American aviatrix Amelia Earhart was born on July 24, 1897, in Atchison, Kansas. Amelia was a rambunctious child go her mother wanted her to be a proper lady instead of a tomboy. During World War I, Amelia became a nurse's aide in Toronto, Canada, and cared for wounded soldiers. Other early jobs included being a telephone operator, tutor, social worker, truck driver, photographer, and stenographer. She also worked as a mail clerk, a job she found tedious, to pay for her flying lessons. Amelia was the first woman to ever climb Pikes Peak in Colorado. 
Amelia tried to avoid any kind of conventional female life. After a plane ride at the airshow, she decided she would learn to fly in 1928. She was invited to be the first female to fly across the Atlantic but only as a passenger with pilot Bill Stoltz. Amelia was an instant sensation. To celebrate Amelia Earhart Day, your children can make a simple plane with a clothespin and a couple of craft sticks. Encourage them to paint their creations yellow to match Amelia's first plane, the Yellow Canary. From paper or felt, your kids can also make a brown pilot's hat and aviator's goggles like those Amelia wore. Amelia's final flight to Howland Island was problematic, overcast skies hindered celestial navigation, and it was discovered later that she was using inaccurate maps. On July 3rd, U.S. Coast Guard vessel Otska received the last communication from Earhart and launched an immediate search. However, the plane was never found. Some of us have great runways already built for us. If you have one, take off. But if you don't have one, realize it is your responsibility to grab a shovel and build one for yourself and for those who will follow after you. Amelia Earhart Passion and courage go together. To achieve great heights, a vision to break out of conventional norms is necessary. Ricky Singh Jane Goodall Change happens by listening and then starting a dialogue with the people who are doing something you don't believe is right. Dame Jane Morris Goodall DBE, on April 3, 1934, formerly Baroness Jane Van Lovick Goodall, was an English primatologist and anthropologist. Seen as the world's foremost expert on chimpanzees, Goodall is best known for her 60-year study of social and family interactions of wild chimpanzees since she first went to Gombe Stream National Park in Tanzania in 1960 where she witnessed human-like behaviors amongst chimpanzees, including armed conflict. In April 2002, she was named a UN Messenger of Peace. Goodall is an honorary member of the World Future Council. The least I can do is speak out for those who cannot speak for themselves. Jane Goodall What you do makes a difference, and you have to decide what kind of difference you want to make. Jane Goodall Interesting Facts Goodall was first introduced to chimpanzees at the tender age of one when she was gifted a toy chimp by her father. Its name is Jubilee, and it remains on Goodall's dresser to this day. Jane met her first chimpanzee on her first birthday. From that day forward, the stuffed ape named Jubilee accompanied the little girl on all her adventures, inspiring the love of animals that would one day shift our views on animal intelligence. She founded the Jane Goodall Institute to benefit the people in Africa who are living in poverty, and to spread the word about conserving animals in nature. Jane has founded several educational programs, including Roots and Shoots, and environmental education programs for young people. In 2002, Jane's work got the attention of the United Nations. When then Secretary General Kofi Annan appointed her as United Nations Messenger of Peace. She was reappointed in 2007. Jane was the first scientist to give names to her research subjects instead of the conventional practice of assigning them numbers. My mission is to create a world where we can live in harmony with nature. And can I do that alone? No. So there is a whole army of youth that can do it. So I suppose my mission is to reach as many of those young people as I can through my efforts, Jane Goodall. Passion to understand and work with animals indicates a deep respect for all living creatures. We must live in harmony with them all. Ricky Singh Ruth Handler The doll had an adult-shaped body, the thing that I had been trying to describe for years, and our guys said it couldn't be done. Ruth Mariana Handler, née Moscow, November 4, 1916, April 27, 2002, was an American businesswoman and inventor. She served as the president of the toy manufacturer Mattel Incorporated in 1959. She invented the Barbie doll, which sold over a billion toys worldwide. She was the founder and president of the world's largest toy company, which at its peak had 18,000 employees and annual sales of over $300 million. In 1974, the handlers were forced to resign from Mattel. And in 1978 Ruth Handler was convicted of false reporting to the Securities and Exchange Commission. They were using the dolls to project the dreams of their futures as adult women, Ruth Handler. I rebuilt my self-esteem, and I rebuilt the self-esteem of others. Ruth Handler Interesting Facts Ruth served as the president of the toy manufacturer Mattel Incorporated in 1959, she invented the Barbie doll, which sold over a billion toys worldwide. She was the founder and president of the world's largest toy company which at its peak had 18,000 employees and annual sales of over $300 million. Barbie has always represented that a woman has choices. Even in her early years, Barbie did not have to settle for only being Ken's girlfriend or an inveterate shopper. She had the clothes, for example, to launch a career as a nurse, a stewardess, a nightclub singer. 
The choices Barbie represents help the doll catch on initially, not just with daughters, who would one day make up the first major wave of women in management and professionals, but also with mothers. Barbie is one of the most iconic consumer products ever made. The fashion doll was created in 1959. And since then, over 1 billion have been sold in toy aisles across the world. Her popularity, the 11-inch plastic doll with an adult figure has been criticized for having unrealistic body proportions. They say that Barbie is so disproportionate that if she was made into a real woman, she would topple over. The idea is that she's pushed an unattainable image of female beauty on generations of girls. So, it comes as a surprise to some that Barbie was created by a woman, Ruth Handler, who was the youngest of 10 children born in 1916 to Polish Jewish immigrants in the United States. Ruth got the idea for Barbie on a trip to Europe, where she encountered a doll that looks like a grown woman. In 1970, tragedy struck. Ruth was diagnosed with breast cancer and underwent a double mastectomy. In her post-surgery search for a prosthetic handler was dissatisfied with the existing options. So she decided to design one herself. We didn't know how to run a business, but we had dreams and talent. Ruth Handler Increasing a girl's self-esteem is good. Yet, parents and society have a responsibility to promote realistic ideas about body image. Ricky Singh Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell I must have something to engross my thoughts, some object in life that will fill this vacuum, and prevent this sad wearing away of the heart. Elizabeth Blackwell, February 3, 1821 May 31, 1910, was a British physician, notable as the first woman to receive a medical degree in the United States, and the first woman on the medical register of the General Medical Council. Blackwell played an important role in both the United States and the United Kingdom as social awareness and moral reformer and pioneered in promoting education for women in medicine. Her contributions remain celebrated with the Elizabeth Blackwell Medal, awarded annually to a woman who has made a significant contribution to the promotion of women in medicine. If society will not admit of woman's free development, then society must be remodeled, Elizabeth Blackwell. When life follows the course of our desires, it is easy to be swept along without thought. Elizabeth Blackwell Interesting facts. Blackwell was steeped in examples of progressive courage from an early age. Despite being in the sugar business, an industry that, in the early 1800s, relied heavily on enslaved people for labor, Blackwell's father was staunchly anti-slavery. When the family moved from England to the United States in 1835, they became active in the American abolitionist movement. Although Elizabeth's family had once been wealthy, they had run into hard times and had immigrated to the United States when Elizabeth was 11 years old. Soon after her father died, Elizabeth spent her teen years knowing what it meant to be meaning. She had deep compassion for others and her compassion drove her to prepare for medical training. She took a job in teaching and at night she read medical books. When Elizabeth finally felt she had learned enough to enter medical school, she wrote to 29 schools seeking admission. Most didn't reply, and others replied rudely that women were not meant to be doctors. Finally, a small medical college in New York put her admission to vote of the dean, professors, and students. After several hours of debate, Elizabeth was accepted. Elizabeth had helped her younger sister Emily attend medical school and become a surgeon. Together they worked in the clinic. They saw 300 patients in their first year and 3,000 patients in the second year. Over the next 90 years, more than a million patients were seen at the clinic Elizabeth founded. She also wrote numerous articles and gave countless speeches to women about nutrition, the need for clean air and exercise, and the importance of keeping one's body and house clean. She helped found and develop the curriculum for both nursing school and a women's medical college where she was a professor of hygiene. If I were rich, I would not begin private practice, but would only experiment, as, however, I am poor, I have no choice. Elizabeth Blackwell, it takes courage to be a pioneer. The joy of it exceeds many ordinary pursuits of life. Ricky Singh Mother Teresa Peace begins with a smile. Mother Mary Teresa Boyajou, August 26, 1910, September 5, 1997, honored in the Catholic Church as St. Teresa of Calcutta was an Albanian Indian Roman Catholic nun and missionary. She was born in Skopje, now the capital of North Macedonia, then part of the Kosovo Vilayet of the Ottoman Empire. After living in Skopje for 18 years, she moved to Ireland and then to India, where she lived for most of her life. The hunger for love is much more difficult to remove than the hunger for bread. Mother Teresa Intense love does not measure, it just gives. Mother Teresa Interesting Facts Mother Teresa was born Agnes Gonja Boyajou, the daughter of an ethnic Albanian grocer. 
She went to Ireland in 1928 to join the Sisters of Loreto at the Institute of the Blessed Virgin Mary and sailed six weeks later to India, where she taught for 17 years at the Order School in Calcutta, Kolkata. In 1928, at the age of 18 Teresa, left home with the aim of becoming a Catholic missionary. She went first to the Loreto Sisters in Ireland. She never saw her family again. In 1929, she traveled to India, where she learned Bengali. She arrived with the equivalent of five rupees. Mother Teresa learned and spoke five languages fluently. She spoke English, Albanian, Serbo-Croat, Bengali, and Hindi. Mother Teresa founded the Order of the Missionaries of Charity, a Roman Catholic congregation of women dedicated to the poor, particularly to those in India, that opened numerous centers serving the blind, the aged, and the disabled. In 1952 she established Nirmal Rite, place for the pure of heart, a hospice for the terminally ill. Distressed by the sight of poverty and suffering, in 1946, she felt an inner call to serve the poor. Nine Mother Teresa gave up her traditional nun habit and adopted an Indian sari, white with a blue edge. The symbolism of her sari was that it was practical and in harmony with Indian culture. The color blue is associated with Mother Mary. White is associated with truth and purity. The three blue bands represent the three main vows of the order. If you want a love message to be heard, it has got to be sent out. To keep a lamp burning, we have to keep putting oil in it. Mother Teresa. Love and respect are universal qualities that all people need to give and receive. Service to poor, destitute, and dying people is the ultimate way to serve God. Ricky Singh. Oprah Winfrey. When you undervalue what you do, the world will undervalue who you are. Oprah Winfrey. Oprah Gail Winfrey, born Orpah Gail Winfrey, January 29, 1954, is an American talk show host, television producer, actress, author, and philanthropist. She is best known for her talk show, The Oprah Winfrey Show, broadcast from Chicago, which was the highest rated television program of its kind in history and ran in national syndication for 25 years, from 1986 to 2011. Dubbed the queen of all media, she was the richest African American of the 20th century was once the world's only black billionaire and the greatest black philanthropist in US history. By 2007, she was sometimes ranked as the most influential woman in the world. The more you praise and celebrate your life, the more there is in life to celebrate. Oprah Winfrey. Real integrity is doing the right thing, knowing that nobody's going to know whether you did it or not. Oprah Winfrey. Interesting facts. In the over three decades since the queen of all media, who's turning 66 on January 29th, became a household name, she's proven that she's a powerhouse at just about everything she puts her mind to. Her first name is spelled Orpah on her birth certificate after a biblical figure in the book of Ruth, but people mispronounced it and Oprah stuck. Winfrey credits her grandmother for guiding her towards success, saying that it was Hattie Mae who encouraged her to speak up in public, giving Winfrey confidence at an early age and a positive sense of self. When she appeared on The Late Show with Stephen Colbert in 2018, she revealed that her intense dislike for gum chewing comes from when she was living with her late grandmother, Hattie Mae Presley Lee. She even stated that her grandmother would try to save gum with the intent of reusing it, and so she would put it on furniture all over the house. Oprah would then bump into it and it would rub up against her. She also admitted she hates it so much that she barred it in her offices. The thing you fear most has no power. Your fear of it is what has the power. Facing the truth really will set you free, Oprah Winfrey. A bright future waits for anyone willing to work hard and create it. Ricky Singh Susan B. Anthony I think a girl who can earn her living and pay her way should be as happy as anybody on earth. The sense of independence and security is very sweet. Susan B. Anthony, born Susan Anthony, February 15, 1820, March 13, 1906, was an American social reformer and women's rights activist who played a pivotal role in the women's suffrage movement. Born into a Quaker family committed to social equality, she collected anti-slavery petitions at the age of 17. In 1856, she became the New York State agent for the American Anti-Slavery Society. I declare to you that women must not depend upon the protection of men but must be taught to protect themselves, and there I take my stand. Susan B. Anthony. Men, their rights, and nothing more, women, their rights, and nothing less. Susan B. Anthony. Interesting facts. Women must have a purse of their own, and how can this be, so long as the wife is denied the right to her individual and joint earnings? Reflections like these, caused Susan to see and feel that there was no true freedom for women without the possession of all her property rights. Six, the 19th Amendment giving women the right to vote was named for Susan B. Anthony. Susan B. Anthony was born in 1820. In Adams, Massachusetts, 
She was from a tight-knit Quaker family who believed in education. The reality was most women were uneducated, could not own property, had few legal rights, and were subservient to men. Susan B. Anthony wanted equal rights under the law for both sexes. Anthony met Elizabeth Cady Stanton, the architect of the first Women's Rights Convention, in Seneca Falls, New York, and the duo teamed up. They were responsible for every right we have as women have today. In 1872, Susan B. Anthony caused a national sensation when she voted in a presidential election illegally. Her trial had an all-male jury, and Anthony was not permitted to speak on her defense. The trial was rigged. Her vote didn't count, but she got great publicity value out of it. Anthony was fined $100, which she never paid. She did, however, continue to spread the word on women's rights throughout the US and Europe. She appeared in front of every Congress from 1869 until 1906, the year she died. Women were finally given the right to vote 16 years after Susan B. Anthony died. Many activists and suffragists argued that women should be free to wear less restrictive clothes than the corsets and heavy underskirts that dominated in those days. To prove their point, many women wore trouser-like bloomers, named for Amelia Bloomer, who advocated them, under their skirts. Following in the footsteps of Stanton, Anthony cut her long, brown hair and started wearing bloomers, albeit somewhat reluctantly. She was ridiculed for her new look and ultimately decided that the negative attention detracted from the message she wanted to convey. She reverted to her old ways after a year. Women must not depend upon the protection of men but must be taught to protect themselves. Susan B. Anthony equal rights are a moral imperative. Great courage and inner vision are required to fight for one's convictions. Ricky Singh Eleanor Roosevelt No one can make you feel inferior without your consent. Anna Eleanor Roosevelt, October 11, 1884, November 7, 1962, was an American political figure, diplomat, and activist. She served as the First Lady of the United States from 1933 to 1945, during her husband President Franklin D. Roosevelt's four terms in office, making her the longest-serving First Lady of the United States. Roosevelt served as United States Delegate to the United Nations General Assembly from 1945 to 1952. President Harry S. Truman later called her the First Lady of the World in tribute to her human rights achievements. Great minds discuss ideas, average minds discuss events, small minds discuss people, Eleanor Roosevelt. No matter how plain a woman may be, if truth and honesty are written across her face, she will be beautiful, Eleanor Roosevelt. Interesting facts. As a child, Anna Eleanor Roosevelt much preferred her middle name and would usually introduce herself by it as she grew older. Roosevelt wasn't wild about her childhood nickname, either, her mother, Anna Hall Roosevelt, found the girl comically old-fashioned and often referred to her as Granny. Eleanor's parents were Elliot and Anna Hall Roosevelt. Elliot was the younger brother of Theodore Teddy Roosevelt, the 26th President of the United States. Anna Hall was descended from the Livingston family. The Livingstons, an old Hudson River family, played an important role in the formation of the new republic. One Livingston administered the oath of office to George Washington, another signed the Declaration of Independence, still another became a Supreme Court Justice. Now measure the distance between this chair and that one, she said. After examining the gap separating the sections for white and black attendees, Roosevelt placed her chair an equal distance between them. They were afraid to arrest her, one witness claimed. Very quickly, the public learned that the new First Lady was not like her predecessors in the White House. She was visibly outspoken and actively involved with her husband's policies and programs. When FDR needed someone to explain his latest New Deal reforms to the people, it was Eleanor who took to the radio. If life were predictable it would cease to be life and be without flavor. Eleanor Roosevelt Humanitarianism, activism, philanthropy, motherhood, and political involvement all combined in Eleanor Roosevelt. When these combine, powerful societal reforms become possible. Ricky Singh Florence Nightingale Very little can be done under the spirit of fear. Florence Nightingale, May 12, 1820, August 13, 1910, was an English social reformer, statistician, and the founder of modern nursing. Nightingale came to prominence while serving as a manager and trainer of nurses during the Crimean War, in which she organized to care for wounded soldiers at Constantinople. She gave nursing a favorable reputation and became an icon of Victorian culture, especially in the persona of the lady with the lamp making rounds of wounded soldiers at night. The greatest heroes are those who do their duty in the daily grind of domestic affairs whilst the world whirls as a maddening dreidel. Florence Nightingale The most important practical lesson that can be given to nurses is to teach them what to observe. Florence Nightingale Interesting Facts Florence Nightingale was a pioneer of public health and the founder of modern nursing. 
At age 24, Nightingale defied her parents' expectations to marry a suitable match and left England to study at the Kaiserswerth Hospital in Dusseldorf, Germany. When she returned from Germany she took a job as a nurse at a hospital in London, and she was eventually promoted after only a year to be head of nursing there. She improved sanitary conditions so much that she garnered a reputation as a reformer and as an advocate for public health. She is a ministering angel without any exaggeration in these hospitals, the London Times wrote of Nightingale in 1855. As their article added, she could often be observed alone, checking up on the wounded with a little lamp in her hand. Just like that, Nightingale won international acclaim as the benevolent lady with the lamp. During the Crimean War when the Allied British and the French forces were fighting the Russian Empire, Florence was called in by the Secretary of War, Sidney Herbert to mobilize nurses and head to the war to help the soldiers. She and her nurses left to find a horrific sight at the military hospital. It was dirty, had rodents, no toilets, and the soldiers were dying of cholera and typhoid more than their injuries. She set to work, mobilizing people to first clean the hospital from top to bottom while she looked into the sick. In the night, she would walk the corridors of the hospital with a lamp checking her patients hence the name the Lady with the Lamp and the Angel of the Crimea. Best known as the Lady with the Lamp, Florence Nightingale was one of Victorian Britain's most celebrated individuals. Her pioneering use of statistics, unwavering principles, and determination to challenge traditional female roles enabled a transformation of attitudes to nursing and hospitals. I think one's feelings waste themselves in words, they ought all to be distilled into actions that bring results. Florence Nightingale Passion to alleviate suffering, along with making much-needed reforms, is the hallmark of an evolved human being. Ricky Singh and Frank Human greatness does not lie in wealth or power, but character and goodness. People are just people, and all people have faults and shortcomings, but all of us are born with basic goodness. Anna Lise Marie Frank, German pronunciation, June 12, 1929. February 1945, was a German Dutch diarist of Jewish heritage. One of the most discussed Jewish victims of the Holocaust, she gained fame posthumously with the 1947 publication of The Diary of a Young Girl, originally Het Ochterhuis in Dutch, English, The Secret Annex, in which she documents her life in hiding from 1942 to 1944, during the German occupation of the Netherlands in World War II. It is one of the world's best-known books and has been the basis for several plays and films. Everyone has inside of him a piece of good news. The good news is that you don't know how great you can be how much you can love, what you can accomplish, and what your potential is, and Frank. Parents can only give good advice or put them on the right paths, but the final forming of a person's character lies in their own hands. And Frank. Interesting facts. Anne's father, Otto, was a German businessman who served in the German army during World War I. In the face of the Nazis' rising anti-Semitism, Otto moved his family to Amsterdam in the autumn of 1933. There, he ran a company that sold spices and pectin for use in the manufacture of jam. Throughout her stay in hiding, and wrote a diary. This diary, after her death, would reveal to the world a first-person account of a Jewish girl's experience of the Holocaust, the fear, the hiding, and the hope for a better future. In her triumphant story of the human spirit, we see and not only as a victim and a survivor but also as the ordinary kid she so much desired to be. Friends who searched the hiding place at the annex after the family's capture later gave Otto Frank the papers left behind. Among them, he found Anne's diary, which was published as Anne Frank, The Diary of a Young Girl, originally in Dutch, 1947. Anne Frank's diary remains one of the most widely read books across the globe. It's been translated into over 60 languages, and over 30 million copies are in print. The world will never forget the story of Anne Frank and her family and the millions of others who lost their lives in the Holocaust. Parents can only give good advice or put them on the right paths, but the final forming of a person's character lies in their own hands. And Frank. Documenting one's experiences in life is a great activity irrespective of circumstances. One never knows how one's writings may impact the world. Ricky Singh. Helen Keller. The best and most beautiful things in the world cannot be seen or even touched, they must be felt with the heart. Helen Adams Keller, June 27, 1880. June 1, 1968, was an American author, disability rights advocate, political activist, and lecturer. Born in West Tuscumbia, Alabama, she lost her sight and hearing after a bout of illness at the age of 19 months. She then communicated primarily using home signs until the age of seven when she met her first teacher and lifelong companion Ann Sullivan, who taught her language, including reading and writing. Sullivan's first lessons involved spelling words on Keller's hand to show her the names of objects around her. She also learned how to speak and to understand other people's speech using the Tadoma method. 
After an education at both specialist and mainstream schools, she attended Radcliffe College of Harvard University and became the first deafblind person to earn a Bachelor of Arts degree. She worked for the American Foundation for the Blind, AFB, from 1924 until 1968. Never bend your head. Always hold it high. Look the world straight in the eye. Helen Keller. Optimism is the faith that leads to achievement. Nothing can be done without hope and confidence, Helen Keller. Interesting facts. Helen Keller wasn't born with a disability, but when she was only 19 months old, she became sick with what the doctors called an acute congestion of the stomach and the brain. These days her illness probably would have been labeled scarlet fever or meningitis, which could now be treated, but back then they often had severe consequences. Keller was born in Tuscumbia, Alabama, on June 27, 1880. When she was 19 months old, an unknown illness caused her to lose her hearing and sight. The Keller family lived fairly modestly, as they lost part of their wealth during the Civil War, Helen's father, Arthur H. Keller, served in the Confederate Army. After the war, he bought and became editor of the North Alabamian, a weekly local newspaper. She has written a dozen of books. The Story of My Life is her autobiographical book but that's not the only book written by Helen Keller. She has 12 published books in her name and she wrote several pieces for prominent publications. Seven by age 10 Helen Keller had mastered Braille as well as the manual alphabet. She also learned to use a typewriter. By age 16 Keller could speak well enough to go to preparatory school, and by age 24. She had graduated from Radcliffe College. She traveled the world in 39 countries, bringing hope and courage to millions of people. She changed the perception of people with vision loss. Rehabilitation centers in schools for the blind were established because revisits in the late 50s and early 60s. Helen's life story was brought to the masses with the miracle worker. Our beloved ones have not gone to a far country. It is only the veil of sense that separates them from us, and even that veil grows thin when our thoughts reach out to them. Helen Keller One who progresses despite disabilities is an inspiration for all, irrespective of disabilities. Ricky Singh Ada Lovelace The science of operations, as derived from mathematics more especially, is a science of itself, and has its abstract truth and value. Augusta Ada King, Countess of Lovelace, December 10, 1815, November 27, 1852, was an English mathematician and writer, chiefly known for her work on Charles Babbage's proposed mechanical general-purpose computer, the analytical engine. She was the first to recognize that the machine had applications beyond pure calculation, and to have published the first algorithm intended to be carried out by such a machine. As a result, she is often regarded as the first computer programmer. As soon as I have got flying to perfection, I have got a scheme about a steam engine. Ada Lovelace. The intellectual, the moral, the religious seem to me all naturally bound up and interlinked together in one great and harmonious whole. Four. Ada Lovelace. Interesting facts. Fearing Lovelace would follow in her father's footsteps, Lady Byron immersed her in mathematics. Lady Byron, herself a mathematical was called Princess of Parallelograms by Lord Byron, believed a rigorous course of study rooted in logic and reason would enable her daughter to avoid the romantic ideals and moody nature of her father. From the age of four, Lovelace was tutored in mathematics and science, an unusual course of study for a woman in 19th century England. At the age of 12, Lovelace conceptualized a flying machine. After studying the anatomy of birds and the suitability of various materials, the young girl illustrated plans to construct a winged flying apparatus before moving on to think about powered flight. At the age of 17, Lovelace met inventor and mathematician Charles Babbage and watched him demonstrate a model portion of his difference engine, an enormous mathematical calculating machine that has led to his being dubbed the father of the computer. After becoming Babbage's protege, she translated into English an article written by a military engineer, and future Italian Prime Minister, Luigi Manabria about Babbage's theoretical analytical engine. Her contributions to computing weren't recognized until a century after her death. Lovelace's ideas about computing were so far ahead of their time that it took nearly a century for technology to catch up. A computer programming language is named in Lovelace's honor. During the 1970s, the U.S. Department of Defense developed a high-order computer programming language to supersede the hundreds of different ones then in use by the military. When U.S. Navy Commander Jack Cooper suggested naming the new language Ada in honor of Lovelace in 1979, the proposal was unanimously approved. The analytical engine has no pretensions whatever to originate anything. It can do whatever we know how and order it to perform. Ada Lovelace Ada fundamentally changed the world in ways that she could not have imagined. Ricky Singh Billie Jean King Be bold. If you're going to make an error, make a doozy, 
and don't be afraid to hit the ball. Billie Jean King, November 22, 1943, is an American former world number one tennis player. King won 39 Grand Slam titles, 12 in singles, 16 in women's doubles, and 11 in mixed doubles. She often represented the United States in the Federation Cup and the Whiteman Cup. She was a member of the victorious United States team in seven Federation Cups and nine Whiteman Cups. For three years, she was the United States captain in the Federation Cup. It is very hard to be a female leader. While it is assumed that any man, no matter how tough, has a soft side. And female leader is assumed to be one-dimensional. Billie Jean King I used to be told if I talked about my sexuality in any way that we wouldn't have a tennis tour. Billie Jean King Interesting Facts Billie Jean King was born November 22, 1943, in Long Beach, California, the eldest child of Bill and Betty Moffat. Raised in a conservative Methodist family, Billie Jean was very religious as a child and originally expressed desires to become a preacher. Billie Jean's mother was predominantly a homemaker but took part-time jobs selling Tupperware and Avon products while her father was an engineer for the local fire department. Billie Jean King grew up poor. It was hard for her parents to support her. Her father was an engineer for a fire department. Her mother was a housekeeper. Her father had two jobs. Her mother sold Tupperware to pay for King's tennis competitions. King's family could not pay to join their local tennis club. Therefore, King learned at public tennis courts. In 1973, King agreed to play former world number one Bobby Riggs in a clash that was dubbed the Battle of the Sexes. With $100,000 up for grabs for the winner, a television audience of millions tuned in. As a child, she wanted to grow up to be a preacher. Raised in a conservative Methodist family, Billie Jean was very religious as a child and originally expressed desires to become a preacher. In 1972, Billie Jean was named Sports Illustrated Sportsperson of the Year, the first woman to be honored as such. In 1974, she created the Women's Sports Foundation, which aimed to provide opportunities for female participation in sport. Sports teaches you character, it teaches you to play by the rules, it teaches you to know what it feels like to win and lose it teaches you about life. Billie Jean King Billie Jean King showed great courage, talent, and perseverance despite many setbacks. Such energy and determination are needed to achieve great heights. Ricky Singh Emily Dickinson Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tunes without the words, and never stops at all. Find ecstasy in life, the mere sense of living is joy enough. Emily Elizabeth Dickinson, December 10, 1830, May 15, 1886, was an American poet. Little known during her life, she has since been regarded as one of the most important figures in American poetry. Dickinson was born in Amherst, Massachusetts, into a prominent family with strong ties to its community. After studying at the Amherst Academy for seven years in her youth, she briefly attended the Mount Holyoke Female Seminary before returning to her family's house in Amherst. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul, and sings the tunes without the words, and never stops at all. Emily Dickinson The soul should always stand ajar, ready to welcome the ecstatic experience. Emily Dickinson Interesting Facts Emily Dickinson lived nearly her entire life in Amherst, Massachusetts. She wrote hundreds of poems and letters exploring themes of death, faith, emotions, and truth. As she got older, she became reclusive and eccentric, and parts of her life are still mysteries. Here are 11 things you might not know about Dickinson's life and work. The poems she published during her lifetime were all published anonymously and may have been published without her even knowing. These poems were published in newspapers. Emily hated the idea of selling her poetry and becoming famous. However, she did enjoy sharing her poems with those close to her. One of her closest friends, Susan, received 250 of her poems. Emily Dickinson kept the majority of her work to herself. Only after her death did her sister discover collections of poetry that Dickinson had compiled and refined during her lifetime. She shared her poetry during her life in written correspondence with friends and occasionally asked for guidance from literary advisors such as Thomas Wentworth Higginson. Poems that were published during her lifetime were mainly done so anonymously or without her consent. Dickinson truly invented a unique style with her poetry that disregarded many common literary rules. She experimented with capitalization and allowed sentences to run on. Her work was inspired by the rhythmic devices of religious psalms, but she commonly interspersed her creative pauses within the stanzas. Despite her cavalier approach to grammar Dickinson's poems have gone on to become regarded as unique literary masterpieces. I know nothing in the world that has as much power as a word. Sometimes I write one, and I look at it until it begins to shine. Emily Dickinson The ability to put into words one's ideas is a skill worth emulating. 
Ricky Singh. Queen Victoria. The important thing is not what they think of me, but what I think of them. Great events make me quiet and calm, it is only trifles that irritate my nerves. Victoria, Alexandrina Victoria, May 24, 1819, January 22, 1901, was Queen of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland from June 20, 1837 until she died in 1901. Known as the Victorian era, her reign of 63 years and 7 months was longer than any previous British monarch. It was a period of industrial, political, scientific, and military change within the United Kingdom, and was marked by a great expansion of the British Empire. In 1876, the British Parliament voted to grant her the additional title of Empress of India. We will not have failure, only success and new learning. Queen Victoria. Give my people plenty of beer, good beer, and cheap beer, and you will have no revolution among them. Queen Victoria. Interesting facts. She was barely 5 feet tall. The monarch was 4 inches shorter than Queen Elizabeth II.6 also, she became the first known carrier of hemophilia, known as the royal disease. She was multilingual. The young queen was an adept linguist, fluent in both English and German. Her mother and governess both had German roots, so Victoria grew up speaking the language and later used it frequently when speaking to her German husband, Prince Albert of Saxe-Coburg and Gotha. The queen also studied French, Italian, and Latin. Queen Victoria was the longest reigning monarch in English history, having kept the throne for 63 years and 7 months, before Queen Elizabeth II beat her record in 2015. For decades, Victoria was also the oldest monarch to ever rule Great Britain, as she died still wearing the crown at age. She survived multiple assassination attempts. During her reign, several attempts were made at Queen Victoria's life, all of them unsuccessful. The first notable attempt was made in 1840 when 18-year-old Edward Oxford fired at the Queen's carriage in London. Oxford was accused of high treason for his crime and was ultimately found not guilty for reasons of insanity, according to the History Channel's website. Two men tried to shoot her in 1842, and in 1849, her carriage was attacked by William Hamilton, an unemployed Irish immigrant who later pled guilty to the crime and was banished for seven years, history reports. One year later, Robert Pate, a former soldier, used an iron-tipped cane to hit the Queen in the head, according to Smithsonian Magazine. We are not interested in the possibilities of defeat, they do not exist, Queen Victoria. Power and responsibility go together. This needs to be realized by all leaders. Ricky Singh Lucille Ball One of the things I learned the hard way was that it doesn't pay to get discouraged. Keeping busy and making optimism a way of life can restore your faith in yourself. Lucille Desiree Ball August 6, 1911, April 26, 1989, was an American actress, comedian, model, studio executive, and producer. She was nominated for 13 Primetime Emmy Awards, winning five times, and was the recipient of several other accolades, such as the Golden Globe Cecil B. DeMille Award and two stars on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Ball earned many honors, including the Women in Film Crystal Award, an induction into the Television Hall of Fame, the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Kennedy Center Honors, and the Governor's Award from the Academy of Television Arts and Sciences. The secret of staying young is to live honestly, eat slowly, and lie about your age, Lucille Ball. Love yourself first and everything else falls into line. You have to love yourself to get anything done in this world. Lucille Ball. Interesting facts. At 12, she auditioned for her first role. After being encouraged by her stepfather, Lucille auditioned for a spot in the chorus line of a local stage production. Naturally, she won the role, and that experience led her to seek a career in showbiz. She was the first female to run a major Hollywood studio. Desilu Productions, named for its founders, Lucille and Desi, was formed in 1950. And until its reincorporation into Paramount Television in 1967, it not only produced I Love Lucy, but it also brought Star Trek, Mission Impossible, and The Untouchables to the small screen. If you think school is tough, you should check out what happened to Lucille Ball. In 1926, Ball attended New York's John Murray Anderson School for the Dramatic Arts as a teenager. But she performed poorly. When it came to the moment Ball had to perform in front of her peers, she got too nervous. Vivian Vance was the perfect comedic sidekick to her on-screen best friend Lucy, Lucille Ball, on I Love Lucy. It's well known among fans that Vance hated her co-star, William Frawley, who played her on-screen husband, Fred. However, she and Ball had such great chemistry as friends on screen that many fans believe the two must have been close in real life. She nearly drowned during the famous grape-stomping scene. 
the other actress involved didn't speak English and some direction was lost in translation, so one held Lucy's head underneath the grape juice. I believe that we're as happy in life as we make up our minds to be. Lucille Ball Lucille Ball continuously broke barriers for women in the entertainment business. Such strength takes society forward. Ricky Singh Cleopatra My honor was not yielded but merely concurred. Cleopatra the seventh Philopod or, 69 BC, 10 August 30 BC, commonly referred to simply as Cleopatra, was queen of the Ptolemaic Kingdom of Egypt, and its last active ruler. A member of the Ptolemaic dynasty, she was a descendant of its founder Ptolemy I Soter, a Macedonian Greek general and companion of Alexander the Great. After the death of Cleopatra, Egypt became a province of the Roman Empire, marking the end of the second-to-last Hellenistic state and the age that had lasted since the reign of Alexander, 336-323 BC. Her native language was Koine Greek, and she was the only Ptolemaic ruler to learn the Egyptian language. All strange and terrible events are welcome, but comforts we despise. Cleopatra. I will not be triumphed over, Cleopatra. Interesting facts. While Cleopatra was born in Egypt, her genealogy goes back to Ptolemy I Soter, one of Alexander the Great's generals. Upon Alexander's death in 323 BCE, Ptolemy took control over Egypt, eventually launching a dynasty of Greek-speaking rulers that lasted three centuries. Although Cleopatra was not ethnically Egyptian, she understood the need to not seem like a foreigner to her subjects. Consequently, she was the first of the Ptolemaic line to learn Egyptian and adopt many of the country's ancient customs. A 1963 film about her was one of the most expensive movies of all time. The Queen of the Nile has been portrayed on the silver screen by the likes of Claudette Colbert and Sophia Loren, but she was most famously played by Elizabeth Taylor in the 1963 sword and sandal epic Cleopatra. The film was plagued by production problems and script issues, and its budget eventually soared from $2 million to $44 million, including some $200,000 just to cover the cost of Taylor's costumes. It was the most expensive movie ever made at the time of its release, and nearly bankrupted its studio despite raking in a fortune at the box office. If inflation is taken into account, Cleopatra remains one of the priciest movies in history even today. The last true pharaoh of Egypt, Cleopatra VII, 69 to 30 BC, has been immortalized through centuries of art, music, and literature for her great physical beauty and love affairs with Julius Caesar and Mark Antony. Leave the fishing rod, great general, to a sovereigns of Pharos and Canopus. Your game is cities, kings, and continents. Cleopatra. The development of Cleopatra's historical image is a testament to the human need to create icons. How much difference is there between the created icon and the actual person? Dash Ricky Singh. J.K. Rowling. It is our choices, Harry, that show what we truly are, far more than our abilities. Joanne Rowling, July 31, 1965, better known by her pen name J.K. Rowling, is a British author, philanthropist, film producer, and screenwriter. She is the author of the Harry Potter fantasy series, which has won multiple awards and sold more than 500 million copies, becoming the best-selling book series in history. The books are the basis of a popular film series, over which Rowling had overall approval on the scripts and was a producer on the final films. She also writes crime fiction under the pen name Robert Galbraith. If you want to see the true measure of a man, watch how he treats his inferiors, not his equals. J. K. Rowling There is an expiry date on blaming your parents for steering you in the wrong direction. The moment you are old enough to take the wheel, the responsibility lies with you. J. K. Rowling Interesting Facts her real name is Joanna Rowling, but the mysterious K has always been a mystery to her fans and followers. The K stands for Kathleen, her paternal grandmother's name. It was added at her publisher's request, who thought a book by an obviously female author might not appeal to the target audience of young boys. Jo wanted to be a writer from an early age. She wrote her first book at the age of six, a story about a rabbit, called Rabbit. At just 11, she wrote her first novel, about seven cursed diamonds and the people who owned them. J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter manuscript was rejected 12 times. The first manuscript of Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone was produced by Rowling while sitting in small cafes around Edinburgh. She lived here with her daughter, and they survived off government benefits. Excited about the work, Rowling bound it up into a folder and sent it off to a publishing agent whom she believed could bring it to the rest of the world. Rowling tells of how she was sent back nothing but a slip that read that the agent's list was full, and they were not interested in Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. Rowling graduated from Exeter University with a BA in French and the Classics. 
she didn't devote too much effort to classes, preferring to read Tolkien and Dickens and listen to albums by the Smiths. This is not to say she was a poor student, however. One professor remembered her as a competent student who gave the appearance of doing what was necessary. It is our choices, Harry, that show what we truly are, far more than our abilities. J. K. Rowling Fantasy writing is a means of understanding many aspects of life and getting a better perspective on it. Ricky Singh Martina Navratilova The mark of great sportsmen is not how good they are at their best, but how good they are their worst. Martina Navratilova, October 18, 1956, is a Czechoslovakian and American former professional tennis player and coach. Widely considered among the greatest tennis players of all time, Navratilova won 18 Grand Slam singles titles. 31 major women's doubles titles, and 10 major mixed doubles titles, for a combined total of 59 major titles, marking the open era record for the most Grand Slam titles won by a single player. She reached the Wimbledon singles final 12 times, including for nine consecutive years from 1982 through 1990, and won the women's singles title at Wimbledon a record nine times, surpassing Helen Wills Moody's eight Wimbledon titles, including a run of six consecutive titles. The difference between involvement and commitment is like ham and eggs. The chicken is involved, the pig is committed. Martina Navratilova The moment of victory is much too short to live for and nothing else. Martina Navratilova Interesting facts. Navratilova reached 11 consecutive major singles finals, second all-time only to Steffi Groff's 13, and is the only woman ever to reach 19 consecutive major semifinals. Navratilova also won the season-ending WTA Tour Championships for top-ranked players a record 8 times and made the finals a record 14 times. Navratilova and Everett probably played the highest scoring women's professional match, when Everett beat Navratilova in the 1979 Colgate International, Eastbourne, England. Everett survived four match points in a three-hour final in 7-5, 5-7, 13-11 score. Navratilova hired Nancy Lieberman to improve her fitness and toughen her mental approach. She also started using Yonex isometric midsize graphite fiberglass composite racket. She became the most dominant player in women's tennis. Martina's grandmother was a tennis player who had represented Czechoslovakia before World War II. Martina picked up the game by spending a lot of time whacking the wall, with her grandmother's wooden racket, while watching her mother play during her spare time. During the year 2000, Martina Navratilova mostly toured to play doubles events, but on rare occasions, also singles. She won the mixed doubles titles at the Australian Open and Wimbledon in 2003. This win extended her overall major titles record to 58. Navratilova played her last career match at Wimbledon in 2006, losing in the third round of mixed doubles. Just a month before her 50th birthday, Navratilova won the 2006 US Open mixed doubles title, making it her 41st major doubles title. Just put one foot in front of the other and don't worry about the length of the path. Once you get on that path, and the longer you stay on it, there eventually will come a time when you will not turn back. Martina Navratilova when one combines physical aptitude with mental strength, a true champion is born. Ricky Singh Harriet Beecher Stowe A woman's health is her capital. Harriet Elizabeth Beecher Stowe, June 14, 1811, July 1, 1896, was an American author and abolitionist. She came from the Beecher family, a religious family, and became best known for her novel Uncle Tom's Cabin, 1852, which depicts the harsh conditions experienced by enslaved African Americans. The book reached an audience of millions as a novel and play, and became influential in the United States and Great Britain, energizing anti-slavery forces in the American North, while provoking widespread anger in the South. Stowe wrote 34 books, including novels, three travel memoirs, and collections of articles and letters. She was influential both for her writings and for her public stances and debates on social issues of the day. When you get into a tight place and everything goes against you, till it seems as though you could not hang on a minute longer, never give up then, for that is just the place and time that the tide will turn. Harriet Beecher Stowe The bitterest tears shed over graves are for words left unsaid and deeds left undone. Harriet Beecher Stowe Interesting facts. Wherever I went among the friends of the era, I found Uncle Tom's Cabin a theme for admiring remark, journalist and social critic Grace Greenwood wrote in a travelogue published in the era. Everywhere I went, I saw it read with pleasant smiles and irrepressible tears. The story was discussed in other abolitionist publications, such as Frederick Douglass's newspaper The North Star, and helped sell $2 annual subscriptions to the era. In 1832, Harriet Beecher moved to Cincinnati with her father, who assumed the presidency of Lane Theological Seminary. According to Harriet Beecher Stowe, 
A Life by Joan D. Hedrick, the Ohio City introduced her to formerly enslaved people and black freemen. She also joined a literary group called the Semicolon Club. The National Women's Hall of Fame is an American institution that was created in 1969. It inducts distinguished American women through a rigid national honor selection process. Nominations are based on the impacts and changes created by recipients that have affected the social and economic aspects of society. Harriet wrote to Gamaliel Bailey who was at the time, the editor of the National Era, an abolitionist newspaper. She told him of her plan to write a story about slavery in June 1851. She released the first installment of her novel titled Uncle Tom's Cabin. An important fact about Harriet Beecher Stowe is that her novel would go on to capture the nation's attention and expose the effects of slavery in Southern America. I feel now that the time comes when even a woman or a child who can speak a word for freedom and humanity is bound to speak. I hope every woman who can write will not be silent. Harriet Beecher Stowe All those who fought against slavery deserve our respect. Ricky Singh Maya Angelou The more you know of your history, the more liberated you are. Maya Angelou, April 4, 1928, May 28, 2014, was an American poet, memoirist, and civil rights, activist. She published seven autobiographies, three books of essays, several books of poetry, and is credited with a list of plays, movies, and television shows spanning over 50 years. She received dozens of awards and more than 50 honorary degrees. Angelou is best known for her series of seven autobiographies, which focus on her childhood and early adult experiences. The first, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, 1969, tells of her life up to the age of 17 and brought her international recognition and acclaim. My mission in life is not merely to survive, but to thrive, and to do so with some passion, some compassion, some humor, and some style. Three, Maya Angelou. When someone shows you who they are, believe them the first time. Maya Angelou. Interesting facts. She recognized the power of words and because of her passion for language, her work stood out as a bright light as she used the power of literature to be an outlet for pain. Instead of letting trauma and pain consume her, Angelou overcame it and went on to live an incredible life. Civil rights activist, Angelou was active in the civil rights movement and served as the Northern Coordinator for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference in 1959. Later, she became close with and worked with Malcolm X poet, she released her first collection of poems in 1971. The Caged Bird Sings, published in 1969, is an autobiography covering Angelou's childhood from the age of 3 through 17. In her work, Angelou discusses racism, trauma, and rape, and how she was able to overcome and grow from these challenges. Since its publication, the book has never been out of print, proving its continued relevancy 50 years after its publication. Throughout her life, Maya Angelou accomplished many things. Before becoming an author at the age of 41, Angelou had worked as a cook, waitress, performer, playwright, editor, and director. She won three Grammys for Best Spoken Word Albums and was nominated for a Tony Award in 1973. By the age of 16 she was the first African American and the first female streetcar conductor in San Francisco. In order to concentrate on work, Angelou would rent out a hotel room near her home when she was writing. She would arrive by 6, taking a thermos of coffee with her, working until noon or 1 before returning home to work further. After taking the room, she had all of the decorations and furniture removed so there was only a bed and table and chair in addition to a thesaurus, dictionary, legal pad and pens, and a bottle of sherry. Do the best you can until you know better. Then when you know better, do better. Maya Angelou. Every life touched, every person helped, every written word read is Maya's legacy. Ricky Singh. Junko Tabe. Technique and ability alone do not get you to the top, it is the willpower that is the most important. This willpower you cannot buy with money or be given by others. It rises from your heart. Junko Tabe, September 22, 1939, October 20, 2016, was a Japanese mountaineer, author, and teacher. She was the first woman to reach the summit of Mount Everest and the first woman to ascend the seven summits, climbing the highest peak on every continent. Tabe wrote seven books, organized environmental projects to clean up rubbish left behind by climbers on Everest, and led annual climbs up Mount Fuji for youth affected by the Great East Japan Earthquake. An astronomer had named asteroid 6897 Tabe after her and in 2019, a mountain range on Pluto was named Tabe Montes in her honor. I can't understand why men make all this fuss about Everest it's only a mountain. Junko Tabe. There was never a question in my mind that I wanted to climb that mountain, no matter what other people said. Junko Tabe. Interesting facts. 
Though Junko's first climb had a striking psychological impact on her, she was aware of the need to pursue higher education and find a respectable job, thanks to the society back then in impoverished, conservative Japan. Junko Ishibashi, born in 1939, was raised in a small agricultural town in the Fukushima prefecture. Growing up as one of seven children, Junko was 4'9 and was reportedly considered petite, weak, and fragile. In a country traumatized by war and poverty, it's perhaps unsurprising that Junko found strength from nature.4.1 Some of the men refused to climb with her, others accused of being there just to find a husband. She persevered, forming relationships with some of the more welcoming older climbers, and in 1969 founded her own climbing club, this one for women. Junko Tabe was one of the most famous female mountaineers. She is best known as the first woman to reach the summit of Mount Everest. She achieved this milestone on May 16, 1975. Despite this, she was the 36th person to climb Everest. She is also the first woman to summit the highest mountain on each of the seven continents. These seven mountains are collectively known as the Seven Summits. She did this while facing gender discrimination in a country where women were often expected to stay at home in that era. In 2000, she went back to university for a postgraduate degree in environmental science. She was worried about the type of tourism that had developed around Everest and concerned with waste on the mountain. After graduation, she became head of the Himalayan Head Trust of Japan. Everest for me, and I believe for the world, is the physical and symbolic manifestation of overcoming odds to achieve a dream. Climbing a mountain is all about overcoming barriers, both physical and mental. Ricky Singh Margaret Higgins Sanger No woman can call herself free who does not own and control her body. No woman can call herself free until she can choose consciously whether she will or will not be a mother. Margaret Higgins Sanger, born Margaret Louise Higgins, September 14, 1879, September 6, 1966, also known as Margaret Sanger Slee, was an American birth control activist, sex educator, writer, and nurse. Sanger popularized the term birth control, opened the first birth control clinic in the United States, and established organizations that evolved into the Planned Parenthood Federation of America. Women must not accept, they must challenge. She must not be awed by that which has been built up around her, she must reverence that woman in her who struggles for expression. Margaret Sanger No woman can call herself free who does not control her own body. Margaret Sanger Interesting facts. A year after her column in the New York Call was banned, Sanger launched The Woman Rebel, an eight-page monthly newsletter advocating contraceptive use. Operating under the slogan No Gods, No Masters, Sanger used the newsletter to openly defy Comstock's eponymous 1873 laws. The Comstock laws made it illegal to use the United States Postal Service to send anything containing information about contraceptives or anything else deemed obscene. She was indicted in August 1914, but she fled to Europe to avoid arrest. She would eventually return to the United States to face trial, but in February 1916 the prosecution dropped the charges. She believed birth control was a free speech issue. Soon after arriving in Greenwich Village, Sanger began writing sex education columns for the New York Call, a socialist newspaper. Her frank discussion of women's sexuality and reproduction offended some readers. In 1913, politician and post office official Anthony Comstock censored her column because he considered her usage of words like syphilis and gonorrhea too vulgar. She was against abortion. Despite her advocacy for family limitations, Sanger disliked the idea of abortion. She believed proper education and legalized contraceptives would reduce the need for the procedure. In her 1938 autobiography, Sanger described her experience treating Sadie Sachs, one of the women in the East Side tenements. In 1912, Sachs's husband called for Sanger's help after he found Sachs unconscious from a self-induced abortion. After three weeks of treatment from both Sanger and a local doctor, the only advice the doctor could offer Sachs was to avoid any more such capers and have her husband sleep on the roof. If we are really to live at all we must put our convictions into action. Margaret Sanger Access to birth control is a fundamental right that needs to be respected by society. Ricky Singh Virginia Opgar Opgar's unflagging determination to provide the best possible care for both women and their babies is perhaps best summed up by her famous quote, Nobody, but nobody, is going to stop breathing on me. Virginia Opgar, June 7, 1909, August 7, 1974, was an American physician, obstetrical anesthesiologist, and medical researcher, best known as the inventor of the Opgar score, a way to quickly assess the health of a newborn child immediately after birth to combat infant mortality. She was a leader in the fields of anesthesiology and teratology and introduced obstetrical considerations to the established field of neonatology. 
Do what is right and do it now. Dr. Virginia Opgar. Over her incredible career and lifetime, Dr. Opgar published more than 60 papers and a book called Is My Baby All Right? With Joan Beck. Interesting facts. What is the Opgar score? The Opgar score is taken one minute after birth to assess how well the infant fared during childbirth and then again at five minutes of life. If the five minute score is low, the test might be scored a third time at 10 minutes. The assessment covers five key areas, skin color, heart rate, grimace response, activity, and respiration. DR. Virginia Opgar's Remarkable Achievements. Dr. Opgar reimagined maternal care globally, and was brave, intelligent, adventurous, strategic, and, by all accounts, warm and fun-loving. The woman who developed the Opgar score was accomplished in many ways. As a student in New Jersey during the early 20th century, Virginia participated on no less than seven different sports teams, performed in school productions, and was a regular contributor to her school's newspaper. After completing two years of a surgical internship at the Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons, she studied anesthesiology under Dr. Ralph Waters, an early pioneer in the field. At the time, many medical doctors considered anesthesiology to be beneath them as it was often practiced by nurses. Until 1946, when the validity of anesthesiology as a specialty was recognized within the medical profession, Dr. Opgar had been the sole staff member in the anesthesiology division and even had to write the textbook for her students herself. Opgar was not an acronym until 1962, when one of her students renamed the areas of focus to suit the letters in her name, appearance, pulse, grimace, activity, and respiration, making it easier to remember. Apparently, Virginia was delighted by this. Every parent owes a debt of gratitude to Virginia Opgar. Ricky Singh Elizabeth Lizzie Maggie For generations, the story of Monopoly's Depression-era origins delighted fans almost as much as the board game itself. Elizabeth J. Phillips, May 9, 1866, March 2, 1948, was an American game designer, writer, feminist, and Georgist. She invented the landlord's game, the precursor to Monopoly, to illustrate the teachings of the progressive era economist Henry George. After moving to the D.C. and Maryland area in the early 1880s, she worked as a stenographer and typist at the Dead Letter Office. She was also a short story and poetry writer, comedian, stage actress, feminist, and engineer. At the age of 26, Maggie received a patent for her invention that made the typewriting process easier by allowing the paper to go through the rollers more easily. At the time, women were credited with less than 1% of all patents. She also worked as a news reporter for a brief time in the early 1900s. In 1910, at age 44, she married Albert Wallace Phillips. At the turn of the century, the American economy had become dominated by a few wealthy families who owned most of the land and natural resources. Lizzie wanted to educate people about the dangers to society from monopolies but knew that the lesson would be better learned if it was fun. Maggie's key role in inventing Monopoly was unearthed in 1973. Economics professor Ralph Ansbach discovered Maggie's patents. Interesting facts. Elizabeth Maggie was a bold and progressive American game designer who created the Landlord's Game, a precursor to Monopoly, to illustrate the economic theories of political economist and journalist Henry George. George believed the economic value acquired from land should belong to all members of society equally. Maggie was born in 1866 in Illinois to a forward-thinking political family. Maggie's father, James Maggie, was a newspaper publisher who had accompanied Abraham Lincoln around Illinois in the 1850s when Lincoln was engaging in public debates with American politician Stephen Douglas. James Maggie was also an anti-monopolist and introduced his daughter to Henry George's 1879 text Progress and Poverty which would later form the backbone of her political beliefs and inspire the creation of the landlord's game. Progress and poverty were incredibly popular, it outsold all books except the Bible in the 1890s, and continues to be influential in left-wing activism and policy. The text outlined the theory that individuals should own what they have made or created, but that land should belong to the collective. The landlord's game was designed to be a practical demonstration of the system of land grabbing and to demonstrate the outcomes and consequences. Maggie's version featured mock money, deeds, and properties that could be bought and sold, while players needed to borrow money from each other or the bank and pay taxes. Maggie's board also featured the square most popularly associated with Monopoly, Go to Jail. She invented one of the most popular games in history by combining her passion for education and economic theory with a sense of fun and competition. Capitalism and philanthropy must go hand in hand for true human progress. Ricky Singh Golda Mayer To be or not to be is not a question of compromise. Either you be or you don't be. Golda Meir, 
born Golda Mabovich, May 3, 1898, December 8, 1978, married name Meyerson slash Meyerson between 1917 to 1956, was an Israeli politician, teacher, and kibbutznik who served as the fourth Prime Minister of Israel. Born in Kiev, she emigrated to the United States as a child with her family in 1906 and was educated there, becoming a teacher. After getting married, she and her husband emigrated to then Palestine in 1921, settling on a kibbutz. Mayer was elected Prime Minister of Israel on March 17, 1969, after serving as Labor Minister and Foreign Minister. The world's fourth and Israel's only woman to hold the office of Prime Minister, and the first in any country in the Middle East, she has been described as the Iron Lady of Israeli politics. One cannot and must not try to erase the past merely because it does not fit the present, Golda Meir. Trust yourself. Create the kind of self that you will be happy to live with all your life. Golda Meir. Interesting facts. From her beginnings in the US, when she spoke no English, she rose to valedictorian of her grade school class. Along the way, she organized a fundraiser for textbook fees and founded the American Young Sisters Society. She discovered activism in grade school. Golda got her to start with political activism in the fourth grade when she and her friend Regina Hamburger organized the American Young Sisters Society to raise money to buy textbooks for classmates who couldn't afford them. Their fundraising efforts included some of Golda's first attempts at public speaking, for which she discovered she had a knack. Born to Golda Mabovich in 1898 in Kiev, Ukraine, then part of the Russian Empire, the future Israeli Prime Minister had a genuinely international upbringing. Her family escaped Russia during a time of increased anti-Jewish sentiment and widespread pogroms, violent mob persecutions of Jewish people, when she was eight years old. Her father, Moshe, left first, he initially sought work in New York City, but then landed in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where he saved enough money to bring his family over, three years after he had arrived. Golda liked Milwaukee, she later wrote of being entranced by her pretty new clothes, by the soda pop, and ice cream and by the excitement of Schuster's department store. Beyond her political achievements, Golda made a sartorial mark by wearing clunky orthopedic shoes, which became known as Natalie Golda, or Golda's shoes. Pairs were supplied to female soldiers for years as part of their uniforms, but they were later phased out, to the relief of many in the army. Those who don't know how to weep with their whole heart, don't know how to laugh either. Golda Mayer. Every great leader has two essential qualities, vision and hope. Ricky Singh. Mackenzie Scott. On June 15, 2021, Scott announced another $2.7 billion in giving to 286 organizations. Forbes reported that Scott donated $8.5 billion across 780 organizations in one year, July 2020 to July 2021. Mackenzie Scott, formerly Bezos, April 7, 1970, is an American novelist and philanthropist. As of November 2021, she has a net worth of US $62.2 billion, owing to a 4% stake in Amazon. As such, Scott is the third wealthiest woman in the United States and the 21st wealthiest individual in the world. She is known for her involvement in the founding and development of Amazon, as well as her now dissolved marriage to Jeff Bezos. As a child, she loved literature and writing stories. Her first attempt at writing was at the age of six when she wrote a 142-page manuscript book that she called The Bookworm. I am a better person when I am writing and I am probably a better mother because I can focus all that laser attention on these characters rather than worrying about my kids. Mackenzie Scott Interesting facts. I was stunned, Ruth Simmons, president of Prairie View A&M University, a historically black college in Prairie View, Texas, told the Times after she learned that Scott was giving it $50 million, the biggest gift the university had ever received. She told the paper she thought she had misheard, and the caller had to repeat the number, 5-0. When Jeff Bezos and Mackenzie Scott divorced in 2019 after the Amazon founder disclosed he was having an affair with former TV anchor Lauren Sanchez, Scott walked away the biggest settlement ever awarded in a marital split, $38 billion in Amazon stock. The end of the 25-year marriage immediately made Scott the world's fourth richest woman. Forbes reported, the unrestricted and ultimately more trusting nature of Scott's philanthropy is the exception, not the norm in their world. The New York Times noted that Ms. Scott has turned traditional philanthropy on its head. By dispersing her money quickly and without much hoopla, Ms. Scott has pushed the focus away from the giver and onto the nonprofits she is trying to help. Scott has said she believes teams with experience on the front lines of challenges will know best how to put the money to good use. She is a published author. Scott, writing as Mackenzie Bezos, is the author of two well-regarded novels, The Testing of Luther Albright, which was named the Los Angeles Times Book of the Year in 2005, and Traps, published eight years later, which Kirkus Reviews called A. 
cleverly orchestrated, cool tone tale. Just months after her divorce, Scott signed on to the Giving Pledge, a commitment to give away at least half of one's money. Led by Bill and Melinda Gates. Donating large amounts of money necessitates a large heart and love for humanity. Ricky Singh. Serena Jamika Williams. I don't like to lose, at anything, yet I've grown most not from victories, but setbacks. Serena Jamika Williams, born September 26, 1981, is an American professional tennis player. She has won 23 Grand Slam singles titles, the most by any player in the open era, and the all-time behind Margaret Court. The Women's Tennis Association, WTA, ranked her singles world number one on eight separate occasions between 2002 and 2017. On her sixth occasion, she held the ranking for 186 consecutive weeks, tying the record set by Steffi Groff. In total, she has been WTA number one for 319 weeks, which ranks third since WTA rankings began behind Groff and Martina Navratilova. She is the only American player, male or female, to win more than 20 majors. It doesn't matter what your background is or where you come from, if you have dreams and goals, that's all that matters. Serena Williams. Victory is very, very sweet. It tastes better than any dessert you've ever had. Serena Williams. Interesting facts. Both Serena together with her elder sister were homeschooled by their father from elementary through high school so that they could spare more time to practice tennis. This move would pay off in the future. Serena spent the majority of her time on the tennis courts. Her training started when she was just three years of age. By the time she was in her mid-teens, she was playing professional tennis. Serena was also amongst the highest paid athletes in the world. Despite her fortune and fame, she is well known for giving back. Apart from donating money to numerous causes, she has partnered with multiple non-profit organizations and charities. She was the co-founder of the Serena Williams Secondary School in Kenya which opened in November 2008. Serena follows a vegan diet. The tennis titan relaxes her diet during the off-season to include protein. However, she strictly adheres to a plant-based diet when she is training and competing. Serena went vegan after her sister, Venus, was diagnosed with Sjogren's syndrome, an autoimmune disease. Although both Serena and Venus are well-established and famous in the tennis fraternity, Serena is the leader based on the number of titles won. Venus has won 49 singles titles whereas Serena has won. Considered as amongst the most dominating and the most talented female tennis player ever, Serena has achieved everything a tennis player can dream of. Apart from her four Olympic medals, she has won 36 major titles. She is the sole female tennis player to have won over $50 million in prize money. Growing up I wasn't the richest, but I had a rich family and spirit. Serena Williams. Excellence is achieved when one echoes with excellence, one day at a time. Ricky Singh. Indra Nui. The only way you're going to achieve what you want is to be a lifelong student. Study everything. Indra Nui, ne Krishnamurti, born October 28, 1955, is an Indian-American business executive and former chairperson and chief executive officer, CEO, of Pepsi. Co. She has consistently ranked among the world's 100 most powerful women. In 2014, she was ranked at number 13 on the Forbes list of the world's 100 most powerful women and was ranked the second most powerful woman on the Fortune list in 2015. In 2017, she was ranked the second most powerful woman once more on the Forbes list of the 19 most powerful women in business. She serves on the boards of Amazon and the International Cricket Council. Leadership is hard to define and good leadership is even harder. But if you can get people to follow you to the ends of the earth, you are a great leader, Indra Nui. I pick up the details that drive the organization insane. But sweating the details is more important than anything else, Indra Nui. Interesting facts. She worked in the graveyard shift as a dorm receptionist just so that she could earn an extra 50 cents. Indra Nui earned a bachelor's degree from Madras Christian College and an MBA from the Indian Institute of Management Calcutta. She began her business career at the textile firm Metter Beardsell in Madras and as a product manager at Johnson & Johnson in Bombay. In 2006, she was named CEO of PepsiCo, replacing Stephen Reinemann, becoming the fifth CEO in the company's 44-year-old history and the first woman CEO of the company. The chairperson and CEO of Pepsi, and a regular in Forbes' Most Powerful Women, it's fair to say Indra Nui has made it. Let's put that in perspective. She is only the fifth head in the history of a company that generates about $66 billion in revenue. Not just business, but Indra Nui has a connection with cricket as well. In 2018, the International Cricket Council appointed her as ICC board as the organization's first independent female director. 
one of the most powerful and well-known women in the business, Nui worked as a receptionist from midnight to 5 a.m. to earn money while obtaining her master's degree at Yale. Nui strongly believes that business and government must come together for the betterment of society and its citizens. Nui created a new strategy in PepsiCo, called Performance with a Purpose. It was largely successful and involved creating long-term growth while leaving a positive impact on society and the environment. I am a mother first, then a CEO, and then a wife. Indra Nui. Leadership, commitment, and tenacity combine to create distinction. Ricky Singh. Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis. We should all do something to right the wrongs that we see and not just complain about them. Jacqueline Lee Jackie Kennedy Onassis, July 28, 1929. May 19, 1994, was an American socialite, writer, photographer, and book editor who served as the First Lady of the United States from 1961 to 1963, as the wife of President John F. Kennedy. A popular First Lady, she endeared the American public with her fashion sense, devotion to her family, and dedication to the historic preservation of the White House. During her lifetime, she was regarded as an international fashion icon. After graduating with a Bachelor of Arts in French Literature from George Washington University in 1951, Bouvier started working for the Washington Times Herald as an inquiring photographer. The following year, she met then-Congressman John Kennedy at a dinner party in Washington. He was elected to the Senate that same year, and the couple married on September 12, 1953, in Newport, Rhode Island. If you bungle raising your children, I don't think whatever else you do matters very much. Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis once you can express yourself, you can tell the world what you want from it. All the changes in the world, for good or evil, were first brought about by words. Jackie Kennedy Interesting facts. She was born to a wealthy family. Jacqueline Lee Bouvier was born in 1929 in New York, the daughter of a Wall Street stockbroker and a socialite. Her father's favorite daughter, she was widely praised as beautiful, intelligent, and artistic, as well as being a successful horsewoman. She married U.S. Representative John F. Kennedy in 1953. Jackie met John F. Kennedy at a dinner party through a mutual friend in 1952. The pair quickly became smitten, bonding over their shared Catholicism, experiences of living abroad, and enjoyment of reading and writing. Kennedy proposed within six months of their meeting, but Jackie was abroad covering Queen Elizabeth II's coronation. Their engagement was announced in June 1953, and the pair married in September 1953, at what was deemed the social event of the year. Widowed, Jackie became the focus of the nation's grief and suffered from bouts of depression. She remarried in 1968 to Aristotle Onassis, a Greek shipping magnate. This decision was met with backlash from the American press and public who saw Jackie's second marriage as a betrayal of her relationship with the fallen president. She quickly became a fashion icon. As the Kennedy star began to rise, they faced more scrutiny. Whilst Jackie's beautiful wardrobe was envied the country over, some began to criticize her expensive choices, deeming her out of touch with the people due to her privileged upbringing. Nonetheless, Jackie's legendary personal style has emulated the world over, from her tailored coats and pillbox hats to strapless dresses, she pioneered two decades of fashion choices and styles, becoming a much scrutinized trendsetter. If you want things to be right, you have to do them yourself. Jackie Kennedy's success in multiple areas of life is the result of recognizing and using the best opportunities. Ricky Singh Harriet Tubman. There are two things I've got a right to, and these are, death or liberty, one or the other I mean to have. No one will take me back alive, I shall fight for my liberty, and when the time has come for me to go, the Lord will let them, kill me. Harriet Tubman, March 18, 22, March 10, 1913, was an American abolitionist and political activist. Born into slavery, Tubman escaped and subsequently made some 13 missions to rescue approximately 70 enslaved people, including family and friends, using the network of anti-slavery activists and safe houses known as the Underground Railroad. During the American Civil War, she served as an armed scout and spy for the Union Army. In her later years, Tubman was an activist in the movement for women's suffrage. Lord, I'm going to hold steady on to you and you've got to see me through. Harriet Tubman Every great dream begins with a dreamer. Harriet Tubman Interesting facts. While Tubman was still a young child, her owners rented her out to neighbors as a house servant. By the age of 12, she was working in the fields. During this time, she demonstrated her first signs of opposition to slavery and its abuses. She once stepped in to stop her master from beating an enslaved man who had tried to escape. She was hit in the head with a two-pound weight and never fully recovered from this injury. 
Throughout her life, she experienced severe headaches and instances in which she would fall into a deep sleep. Born Araminta Minty Ross in Maryland around 1822, Harriet adopted her mother's name after escaping slavery. She lived a remarkably full life, especially for an African-American woman of that time period. She lived to the ripe age of 91, dying at a charity home she founded in Auburn, New York. She was buried with full military honors. Harriet was born a slave and raised on Maryland's eastern shore where the lines between slavery and freedom were often blurred. It was not unusual for families in this area to include both free and enslaved members. Harriet's husband, John Tubman was a free black man. She made a daring escape from slavery when she was in her 20s, she served as a conductor of the Underground Railroad for 11 years. Harriet Tubman guided at least 70 slaves to freedom. She worked as a Union scout and spy during the American Civil War. Harriet Tubman escaped from slavery in the South to become a leading abolitionist before the American Civil War. She led hundreds of enslaved people to freedom in the North along the route of the Underground Railroad. I freed a thousand slaves and I could have freed a thousand more if only they knew they were slaves, Harriet Tubman. The drive to seek freedom has created great leaders who have set the foundation for intergenerational freedom. Ricky Singh Jacinda Ardern You can't ask other people to believe you and vote for you if you don't back yourself. Jacinda Kate Laurel Ardern, born July 26, 1980, is a New Zealand politician who has been the 40th Prime Minister of New Zealand and leader of the Labour Party since 2017. She was first elected to the House of Representatives as a List MP in 2008 and has been a Member of Parliament MP, for Mount Albert since March 2017. Born in Hamilton, Ardern grew up in Morinsville and Murupara, where she attended a state school. After graduating from the University of Waikato in 2001, Ardern worked as a researcher in the office of Prime Minister Helen Clark. She later worked in London as an advisor in the Cabinet Office. In 2008, Ardern was elected President of the International Union of Socialist Youth. Ardern was first elected as an MP in the 2008 general election when Labour lost power after nine years. She was later elected to represent the Mount Albert electorate. In a by-election on February 25, 2017, everything I've ever thought about doing has been, in some sense, about helping people, Jacinda Ardern. Probably being in politics is the worst place for me to be. Jacinda Ardern. Interesting facts. Ardern was one of 15 women selected to appear on the cover of the September 2019 issue of British Vogue, by guest editor Meghan, Duchess of Sussex. Forbes magazine has consistently ranked her among the 100 most powerful women in the world, placing 34 in 2021. She was included in the 2019 Time 100 list and shortlisted for Time's 2019 Person of the Year. The magazine later incorrectly speculated that she might win the 2019 Nobel Peace Prize among a listed six candidates, for her handling of the Christchurch mosque shootings. In 2020, she was listed by Prospect as the second greatest thinker for the COVID-19 era. On November 19, 2020, Ardern was awarded Harvard University's 2020 Glatesman International Activist Award. She contributed the US $150,000, 216,000 New Zealand dollar, prize money to New Zealanders studying at the university. Before Ardern stepped in, the Labour Party was treading on shaky ground, with former party leader Andrew Little renouncing his position just seven weeks before the election. As soon as she was voted by her colleagues to take Little's place, Ardern's team began to work on what she called the campaign of our lives and the term Jacinda Mania quickly gained traction both in New Zealand and abroad. Raised as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in New Zealand, Ardern left the church in 2005 at age 25 because, she said, it conflicted with her personal views, in particular her support for gay rights. In January 2017, Ardern identified as agnostic, saying I can't see myself being a member of an organized religion again. As Prime Minister in 2019, she met the president of LDS Church, Russell M. Nelson. Back on 19th of March, Ardern closed the country off due to the virus pandemic. Then, on 23rd of March, she announced a nationwide lockdown. This required all non-essential workers to stay at home. Schools, offices, restaurants, bars, places of worship, and even playgrounds were shut as part of the lockdown. And back then, they had fewer than 300 cases. Taking on a leadership role doesn't mean that you only have to be personally ambitious. Jacinda Ardern The world needs more women in high-level positions. Ricky Singh Aung San Suu Kyi It is not power that corrupts but fear. Fear of losing power corrupts those who wield it and fear of the scourge of power corrupts those who are subject to it. Aung San Suu Kyi, born June 19, 1945, 
is a Burmese politician, diplomat, author, and a 1991 Nobel Peace Prize laureate who served as state councillor of Myanmar, equivalent to a prime minister, and minister of foreign affairs from 2016 to 2021. She has served as the chairperson of the National League for Democracy, NLD, since 2011, having been the general secretary from 1988 to 2011. She played a vital role in Myanmar's transition from military junta to partial democracy in 2010. I don't think of myself as unbreakable. Perhaps I'm just rather flexible and adaptable. Aung San Suu Kyi. I think that freedom is sometimes a state of mind. Sometimes, mind you, but not always. Aung San Suu Kyi. Interesting facts. Aung San Suu Kyi was born in Rangoon, Burma, now known as Yangon, Myanmar, as the daughter of General Aung San of the Burma Independence Army, hailed as a hero for playing a part in Burma's independence from Britain. Sadly, he was assassinated when she was only two years old. Aung San Suu Kyi was placed under house arrest at her home, during which time she was awarded the Sakharov Prize for Freedom of Thought in 1990, and the Nobel Peace Prize one year later. Her sons Alexander and Kim accepted the Nobel Peace Prize on her behalf. She was detained by Myanmar's military, officially known as the Tatmadaw, after the coup d'etat that overthrew the civilian government earlier this year and established a military dictatorship. Aung San Suu Kyi, who was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1991, has been in prison or under house arrest, off and on since 1989. She was found guilty on August 11, 2009 of breaking a security law by allowing American intruder John Yeta to stay at her lakeside home for two nights. Critics said the charges were trumped up to prevent her from having any influence over the 2010 polls. Chi started a non-violent movement for human rights when Myanmar was in a time of political unrest. Protests were led by students, office workers, monks, and others to demand democratic reform, were flooding Yangon streets, and something sparked in Aung San Suu Kyi. She went on to make her first public address on August 26, 1988 outside the Shwedagon Pagoda, saying, I could not as my father's daughter remain indifferent to all that was going on. Human beings the world over need freedom and security that they may be able to realize their full potential, Aung San Suu Kyi. Freedom fighters are stirred from within when they see injustices and human bondage. Ricky Singh Coco Chanel Fashion fades, only style remains the same. Gabrielle Bonner Coco Chanel, August 19, 1883, January 10, 1971, was a French fashion designer and businesswoman. The founder and namesake of the Chanel brand, she was credited in the post-World War I era with popularizing a sporty, casual chic as the feminine standard of style, replacing the corseted silhouette that was dominant beforehand. A prolific fashion creator, Chanel extended her influence beyond couture clothing, realizing her design aesthetic in jewelry, handbags, and fragrance. Her signature scent, Chanel No. 5, has become an iconic product. She is the only fashion designer listed on Time magazine's list of the 100 most influential people of the 20th century. Chanel herself designed her famed interlock CC monogram, which has been in use since the 1920s. To be irreplaceable, one must always be different. Coco Chanel The best color in the whole world is the one that looks good, on you. Coco Chanel Interesting facts Born Gabrielle Chanel on August 19, 1883, the future fashion designer came from humble beginnings. After her mother died when Chanel was around 12, her peddler father put her and her two sisters in a convent-run orphanage. The nuns there taught her to sew, and the stark black and white of their habits began to inform her design aesthetic. What is Coco Chanel known for? Coco Chanel was a fashion designer known for such now classic innovations as the woman's suit, the quilted purse, costume jewelry, and the little black dress. She also introduced the phenomenally successful perfume, Chanel, no. Coco Chanel introduced pants for women. She outraged the fashion world when she wore pants in Venice, to make traveling by gondola easier. Coco Chanel decided that there was no comfortable way to ride a horse while wearing a long skirt. She was always a risk taker which made her go places for sure. The story behind Chanel's iconic perfume is full of twists and turns. In the early 1920s, Chanel worked with perfumer Ernest Beau to create the scent. Reportedly, Chanel liked Beau's fifth sample, leading to the now famous name. Also, five was said to be her lucky number, but the scent, with notes of jasmine, rose, sandalwood, and vanilla, might have been the result of a laboratory mistake. The formula had an unusually high dose of aldehyde in it, a synthetic component that made the scent sparkle. The fragrance and its groundbreaking, minimalist bottle design would go on to become one of the best-selling and most recognized perfumes in the world. The best things in life are free. The second best things are very, very expensive. 
Coco Chanel. Just as there is outward fragrance, there is an inner fragrance. Learn to connect both. Ricky Singh. Gertrude Ederly. To me, the sea is like a person, like a child that I've known a long time. It sounds crazy, I know, but when I swim in the sea, I talk to it. I never feel alone when I'm out there. On August 6, 1926, 21-year-old Gertrude Ederly battled the cold, choppy waters of the Atlantic Ocean to become the first woman to ever swim across the English Channel. Even more impressive, Ederly recorded the fastest time in history by more than 2 hours, besting all 5 men who had previously gone the distance. It gets even more spectacular because of the especially rough ocean conditions at the time. Ederly tackled at least 14 more miles than she would have had she been able to chart a straight line, 35 versus 21 miles, per the New York Times. But Ederly's truly mind-boggling accomplishment was bigger than one single swim. It made a memorable contribution in an age when many found it difficult to take female athletes seriously. The Times wrote in Ederly's 2003 obituary. Among Ederly's other accomplishments in the sport, dozens of amateur national and world records, plus 3 Olympic medals in swimming. After her hearing was permanently impaired during the record-breaking swim, she also went on to teach the sport to deaf children. When somebody tells me I cannot do something, that's when I do it. Get true Ederly. Slowly I came to know that the depth of our heartbreaks determines the depth of our faith. God gives us everything to conquer the big and the little hurts of life. Get true Ederly. Interesting facts. As a teen, Ederly left school to train as a competitive swimmer and joined the Women's Swimming Association. Competing locally, she had her first win at the age of 16, and between 1921 and 1925 she held 29 records. In 1922 she broke 7 records in a single afternoon at Brighton Beach, New York. At the 1924 Olympic Games in Paris, she was a member of the US team that won a gold medal in the 4x100 meter freestyle relay. She also captured bronze medals in the 100 meter and 400 meter freestyle events. In 1925 Ederly made an unsuccessful attempt to swim the English Channel, but the following year she returned to France to try again. In the face of widespread doubt that a woman could accomplish the feat, she set out from Cape Grisnes near Calais, France, on August 6th and swam the 35 miles, 56 kilometers, to Dover, Kent, England, in 14 hours 31 minutes, beating the men's world record by 1 hour 59 minutes. Ederly was greeted on her return to New York City by a ticker tape parade, and she toured for a time as a professional swimmer. A series of misfortunes, culminating in a serious back injury in 1933, ended her public career for a time. But in 1939, she appeared in Billy Rose's Aquacade at the New York World's Fair. Only five men had ever swum the waterway before. The challenges included quickly changing tides, six-foot waves, frigid temperatures, and lots of jellyfish. That day, Ederly not only made it across, but she also beat all of the previous men's times, swimming 35 miles in 14 and a half hours. Ederly. whose hearing was permanently impaired while achieving her English Channel triumph later became a swimming instructor for deaf children she was inducted into the International Swimming Hall of Fame in 1965 and the Women's Sports Hall of Fame in 1980 people said women couldn't swim the channel but i proved they could get true utterly the path to achievement is to take determined action with a process oriented mindset ricky singh virginia wolf my brain is to me the most unaccountable of machinery always buzzing, humming, soaring, roaring, diving, and then buried in mud. And why? What's this passion for? Adeline Virginia Woolf Stephen, January 25, 1882, March 28, 1941, was an English writer, considered one of the most important modernist 20th century authors and a pioneer in the use of stream of consciousness as a narrative device. Woolf was born into an affluent household in South Kensington, London. The seventh child of Julia Prince F. Jackson and Leslie Stephen in a blended family of eight, which included the modernist painter Vanessa Bell, she was homeschooled in English classics and Victorian literature from a young age. Some people go to priests, others to poetry. I to my friends, Virginia Woolf. Why are women so much more interesting to men than men are to women? Virginia Woolf. Interesting facts. She worked as a night school teacher. The death of Virginia's father Sir Leslie Stephen in 1904 had left her and her siblings with only a modest inheritance. This was the early 20th century, and for clever, independent women like Virginia, working was often the better option than getting married for money and security. And Virginia worked hard, along with her journalism work, writing book reviews and articles for various publications. Virginia also took on a part-time job as a night school teacher to supplement her income. Beyond the feminism for which she is known, Wolf's lyrical writing is characterized by and celebrated for her love of experimentation. Indeed, 
Her novels are highly experimental. From the poetic monologues in the waves to the unique temporal structure of To the Lighthouse, all of Wolfe's works challenge the idea of a traditional narrative in some way. Wolfe was writing nearly a review a week for the Times Literary Supplement in 1918. Her essay Modern Novels, 1919, revised in 1925 as modern fiction, attacked the materialists who wrote about superficial rather than spiritual or luminous experiences. She battled mental illness her whole life. Throughout the entirety of her life, Wolfe struggled with mental illness. Spurred on by sexual abuse at the hand of her two half-brothers, Wolfe first began battling psychological issues as a child. These issues worsened when her mother and one of her sisters died and were exacerbated by her father's death, which led to her first stay in a mental health facility. As a British author, critic, and essayist, she is known for her famous works, To the Lighthouse, A Room of One's Own, and Mrs. Dalloway. She was the pioneer figure in the use of the stream of consciousness method. If you do not tell the truth about yourself, you cannot tell it about other people. Virginia Woolf. Great literary works contribute to the evolution of the human mind, which causes humanity to grow. Ricky Singh. Whoopi Goldberg. If you want to be somebody, if you want to go somewhere, you've got to wake up and pay attention. Karen Elaine Johnson, born November 13, 1955, known professionally as Whoopi Goldberg, is an American actor, comedian, author, and television personality. A recipient of numerous accolades, she is one of 16 entertainers to win the EGOT, which includes an Emmy Award, a Grammy Award, an Academy Award, and a Tony Award. Goldberg began her career on stage in 1983 with her one-woman show, Spook Show, which transferred to Broadway under the title Whoopi Goldberg, running from 1984 to 1985. She won a Grammy Award for Best Comedy Album for the recording of the show. I am where I am because I believe in all possibilities. Whoopi Goldberg. My family is Jewish, Buddhist, Baptist, and Catholic. I don't believe in man-made religions. Whoopi Goldberg. Interesting facts. She is equally well known for her humanitarian efforts on behalf of children and the homeless, in support of human rights and education, against substance abuse and AIDS, as well as efforts for other causes and charities. Among her many philanthropic activities, Ms. Goldberg is a United Nations Goodwill Ambassador. Her film Breakthrough came in 1985 with her role as Seely, a mistreated woman in the Deep South, in Steven Spielberg's period drama film The Color Purple, for which she won the Golden Globe Award for Best Actress in a Motion Picture, Drama. For her performance as an eccentric psychic in the romantic fantasy film Ghost, 1990, she won the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actress and a second Golden Globe Award. She starred in the comedy Sister Act, 1992, its sequel, Sister Act 2, Back in the Habit, 1993, and Theodore Rex, 1996. She became the highest paid actress at the time. Six Whoopi's hard work paid off when she was recognized as one of the only 10 people to have won a Grammy, Oscar, Emmy, Daytime Emmy Award as well as a Tony. Goldberg created The Spook Show, a one-woman show composed of different character monologues in 1983. Director Mike Nichols offered to take the show to Broadway. The show retitled Whoopi Goldberg for its Broadway incarnation ran from October 24, 1984, to March 10, 1985, for a total of 156 performances. The play was taped during this run and subsequently broadcast by HBO as Whoopi Goldberg, direct from Broadway in 1985.7 also, she was the first woman to host the Academy Awards on her own. At one time she worked in a mortuary. This sounds kind of grisly, but she was the individual that would make the bodies look decent by putting makeup on them so that they could be presented to loved ones for the funeral. It almost seems as though you'd need an iron stomach even for this. When you are kind to someone in trouble, you hope they'll remember and be kind to someone else. And it'll become like a wildfire. Whoopi Goldberg. An acting career has many difficulties and the road to success is extremely difficult. To stay on the track, without deflection, is the goal. Ricky Singh. Nadia Comaneci. It's very hard to get to the top. It's hardest to stay at the top. Nadia Elena Komanich Connor, born November 12, 1961, known professionally as Nadia Komanich Romanian, is a Romanian retired gymnast and a five-time Olympic gold medalist, all in individual events. In 1976 at the age of 14, Komanich was the first gymnast to be awarded a perfect score of 10.0 at the Olympic Games. At the same Games, 1976 Summer Olympics in Montreal, she received six more perfect tens for events en route to winning three gold medals. At the 1980 Summer Olympics in Moscow, Komanich won two more gold medals and attained two more perfect tens. I believe that you should gravitate to people who are doing productive and positive things with their lives, Nadia Komanich. 
I always say, when the Olympics are happening, you shouldn't be in any other place on the planet, you should be here. Nadia Comaneci. Interesting facts. Nadia Comaneci created a sensation in the 1976 Montreal Summer Olympics when she dazzled the judges with her performance to the extent that they had no choice but to give her a score of perfect 10, a score which had never been achieved previously in Olympic history. 14-year-old Romanian gymnast Nadia Comaneci was awarded the first-ever perfect score of 10.0 for her performance on the uneven bars. She went on to earn seven maximum marks in total. The games were boycotted by 26 countries, mostly from Africa when the International Olympic Committee denied their request to ban New Zealand, whose national rugby team had recently toured South Africa, which had been barred from Olympic competition since 1964 because of its government's apartheid policies. She won three gold medals for the uneven bars, balance beam, and individual all-round. She also won bronze for floor exercise and silver as part of the team all-round. Komanich dominated the games with seven scores of 10, overshadowing Olga Korbut of the Soviet Union. At the 1980 Olympic Games in Moscow, she won gold medals for the beam and the floor exercises, tying for first in the latter event with Nelly Kim of the USSR. She won a silver medal as a member of her team and tied with Maxine Yuck of East Germany for second place in the all-around individual competition. She retired from the competition in 1984. Jump off the beam, flip off the bars follows your dreams, and reach for the stars. Nadia Komanich. Talent, hard work, and the right mentors create champions. Ricky Singh. Malala Yousafzai. One child, one teacher, one pen, and one book can change the world. Malala Yousafzai, Pashto pronunciation, Pashto, Milal Yousafz Urdu, Milal Yousafza, born July 12, 1997, often referred to mononymously as Malala, and by her married name, Malala Yousafzai Malik is a Pakistani activist for female education and a Nobel Peace Prize laureate. She is also the world's youngest Nobel Prize laureate, and second Pakistani to ever receive a Nobel Prize. She is known for human rights advocacy, especially the education of women and children in her native Swat Valley in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, northwest Pakistan, where the Tariq i Taliban Pakistan had at times banned girls from attending school. I raise my voice not so I can shout, but so that those without a voice can be heard. We cannot succeed when half of us are held back. Malala Yousafzai. There should be no discrimination against languages people speak, skin color, or religion. Malala Yousafzai. Interesting facts. Malala Yousafzai was born in the Swat district of northwestern Pakistan, where her father was a school owner and was active in educational issues. After having blogged for the BBC since 2009 about her experiences during the Taliban's growing influence in the region, in 2012 the Taliban attempted to assassinate Malala Yousafzai on the bus home from school. She survived but underwent several operations in the UK, where she lives today. In addition to her schooling, she continues her work for the right of girls to education. Malala Yousafzai is the youngest person to receive a Nobel Prize. While there are many essential Malala Yousafzai facts, one of the most notable ones is her status as the youngest Nobel Prize laureate in history. On October 10, 2014, Malala Yousafzai became co-recipient for the Nobel Peace Prize. She received the 2014 Nobel Peace Prize in Norway along with children's rights advocate Kailash Sidyarti. At 17 years old, Malala became the youngest person to ever receive a Nobel Prize, along with being the second Pakistani in history to receive one. Yousafzai has delivered countless memorable speeches in front of crowds and penned shareable quotes in her writings. When the whole world is silent, even one voice becomes powerful, she wrote in her book I Am Malala. During the first ever youth takeover of the UN in 2013, she said, So let us wage a global struggle against illiteracy, poverty, and terrorism, and let us pick up our books and pens. They are our most powerful weapons. To provide girls around the world with equal educational opportunities, she co-founded the Malala Fund charity in 2013. Malala opened an all-girls school for Syrian refugees when she turned 18. In 2015, NASA named the asteroid 316201 Malala after her. In 2012, Malala received Pakistan's third highest civilian bravery award, Sitara E. Shuja, extremists have shown what frightens them most. A girl with a book. Malala Yousafzai advocacy and activism for education are one of the noblest activities in life. Ricky Singh Catherine Graham To love what you do and feel that it matters how could anything be more fun? Catherine Meyer Graham, June 16, 1917, July 17, 2001, was an American newspaper publisher. She led her family's newspaper, The Washington Post, from 1963 to 1991. 
Graham presided over the paper as it reported on the Watergate scandal, which eventually led to the resignation of President Richard Nixon. The thing women must do to rise to power is to redefine their femininity. Once, power was considered a masculine attribute. Power has no sex. Catherine Graham. No one can avoid aging, but aging productively is something else. Catherine Graham. Interesting facts. Graham's father, Eugene Meyer, bought the Post in 1933 and served as the newspaper's publisher until Harry Truman asked him to become the first head of the World Bank in 1946. Meyer named Catherine's husband, lawyer Philip Graham, as the paper's new publisher. Graham may have wielded a lot of power as the Post's publisher, but she wasn't hesitant about chipping in where she was needed. In 1974 a newspaper guild strike left the Post with less than 20% of its normal staff. Graham helped out by answering phones for the circulation and classified desks. In one particularly memorable episode, she took a classified ad for a used Mercedes. After reading the ad back to the seller, he remarked that she must be overqualified for the job and that answering the phone wasn't her regular work. Catherine Graham helmed the Washington Post from the 1960s through 1991, and under her steady, resolute leadership the paper was able to break huge stories like the Nixon White House's cover-up of the Watergate break-in. For many years she was the only female head of a Fortune 500 company. So let's take a look at five things you might not know about this journalism and business pioneer. We live in a dirty and dangerous world. There are some things the general public does not need to know, and shouldn't. I believe democracy flourishes when the government can take legitimate steps to keep its secrets and when the press can decide whether to print what it knows. 1988. Within days after her husband's death, Mrs. Graham told the board of directors that the Post Company would stay in the family. On September 20, 1963, after a month's cruise in the Aegean with her mother and daughter and some friends, she assumed the presidency of the company. To love what you do and feel that it matters, how could anything be more fun? Catherine Graham The media has a great responsibility to unravel and report the truth accurately. Ricky Singh Grace Hopper One accurate measurement is worth a thousand expert opinions. Grace Brewster Murray Hopper, nay Murray, December 9, 1906, January 1, 1992, was an American computer scientist and United States Navy Rear Admiral. One of the first programmers of the Harvard Mark I the computer, she was a pioneer of computer programming who invented one of the first linkers. Two Hopper was the first to devise the theory of machine-independent programming languages, and the phlegmatic programming language she created using this theory was later extended to create COBOL, an early high-level programming language still in use today. A ship in port is safe, but that's not what ships are built for. Grace Hopper it is often easier to ask for forgiveness than to ask for permission. Grace Hopper Interesting facts. Grace Murray Hopper was one of the first computer programmers to work on the Harvard Mark I. She was also a United States Navy Rear Admiral, helped develop COBOL, one of the first high-level programming languages, and invented the first compiler, a program that translates programming code to machine language. She is credited with coining the terms bug and debug as related to computer errors. One day a computer failure stumped Hopper and her team until she opened the machine and found a moth inside. Taping the moth into her logbook, she wrote, first actual bug found. She was a big believer in mentorship, once saying, the most important thing I've accomplished, other than building the compiler, is training young people. They come to me, you know, and say, do you think we can do this? I say, try it. And I back them up. Her mother once left seven-year-old Grace unattended and returned to discover her inquisitive daughter had made a tour of their home, collected seven clocks, and dismantled them all. Grace had started by dismantling just one clock to investigate its mechanism. Then she panicked because she didn't know how to put it together again. Trying to figure out how to put a clock together, she got another clock, dismantled it, and put it back together. The Great Depression began in 1928, and by 1931 over 8 million Americans were unemployed, the unemployment rate was 16%. Times were hard, so in 1931 Grace Hopper was delighted to accept work as a mathematics assistant at Vassar College. She took a fresh approach to courses and incorporated ideas from other subjects such as chemistry. Her new approach was rewarded with a surge in the number of students taking math courses. One accurate measurement is worth a thousand expert opinions. Grace Hopper Where would we be today without computer languages? Our life revolves around them. Dash Ricky Singh Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Real change, enduring change, happens one step at a time. Joan Ruth Bader Ginsburg March 15, 1933, September 18, 2020, was an American lawyer and jurist who served as an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States from 1993 until she died in 2020. 
She was nominated by President Bill Clinton to replace retiring Justice Byron White, and at the time was generally viewed as a moderate consensus builder. She eventually became part of the liberal wing of the court as the court shifted to the right over time. Ginsburg was the first Jewish woman and the second woman to serve on the court, after Sandra Day O'Connor. During her tenure, Ginsburg wrote notable majority opinions, including United States v. Virginia, 1996, Olmsted v. L.C., 1999, Friends of the Earth Inc. v. Laidlaw Environmental Services Inc., 2000, and City of Cheryl v. Oneida Indian Nation of New York, 2005. Don't be distracted by emotions like anger, envy, resentment. These just sap energy and waste time. Ruth Bader Ginsburg. My mother told me to be a lady. And for her, that meant be your person, be independent. Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Interesting facts. Ruth is not Ruth Bader Ginsburg's first name. She was born Joan Ruth Bader in 1933 to Nathan and Celia Bader in Brooklyn. When it was time to enroll her daughter in school, Celia Bader learned that there were several girls named Joan in the class, so they opted to call her Ruth to avoid confusion. Even though Sandra Day O'Connor sat on the U.S. Supreme Court for 12 years before Ruth Bader Ginsburg was appointed, the court did not have a women's bathroom until Ginsburg pointed it out. Despite their conflicting political views, Justice Ginsburg and the late Justice Antonin Scalia were close friends and shared a love of the opera. They appeared as extras in a party scene of Richard Strauss Ariadne Alf Naxos in 2009. There is even an opera that was written about their friendship called Scalia slash Ginsburg by Derek Wang. Ruth Bader Ginsburg is known as a severe editor of her clerk's writing, even correcting minor punctuation on essays and speeches that will never be spoken or published. The collars are more than a fashion statement, however, Ginsburg wears particular collars to denote her opinion on a ruling. Her majority opinion lace collar was a gift from a former clerk, whereas a mirrored necklace serves as her descent collar. Ginsburg was 87 years old when she passed and had gone through multiple battles with cancer and a heart operation. Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away on September 18, 2020. Justice Ginsburg was a social icon, a champion for equal rights, and a historic trailblazer. I ask no favor for my sex. All I ask of our brethren is that they take their feet off our necks. Ruth Bader Ginsburg. The Supreme Court's power is immense. Each justice can impact the lives of millions for generations. Ricky Singh. Shearing a body. I maintain that nothing useful and lasting can emerge from violence. Shiri Nabadi, born June 21, 1947, is an Iranian political activist, lawyer, former judge, human rights activist, and founder of Defenders of Human Rights Center in Iran. On October 10, 2003, Abadi was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for her significant and pioneering efforts for democracy and human rights, especially women's, children's, and refugee rights. Abadi was born in Hamadan. Her father, Muhammad Ali Abadi was the city's chief notary public and a professor of commercial law. Her family moved to Tehran in 1948. She was admitted to the law department of the University of Tehran in 1965 and in 1969, upon graduation, passed the qualification exams to become a judge. After a six-month internship period, she officially became a judge in March 1969. She continued her studies at the University of Tehran in the meantime to pursue a doctorate's degree in law in 1971. In 1975, she became the first woman president of the Tehran City Court and served until the 1979 Iranian Revolution. She was also the first ever woman judge in Iran. We must not enable anyone to impose his personal view regarding religion on others by force, oppression, or pressure. Shiri Nabadi. Human rights are a universal standard. It is a component of every religion and every civilization. Shiri Nabadi. Interesting facts. Shiri Nabadi, born June 21, 1947, Hamadan, Iran, Iranian lawyer, writer, and teacher, received the Nobel Prize for Peace in 2003 for her efforts to promote democracy and human rights, especially those of women and children in Iran. She was the first Muslim woman and the first Iranian to receive the award. Shiri Nabadi took up the struggle for fundamental human rights and especially the rights of women and children. She took part in the establishment of organizations that placed these issues on the agenda and wrote books proposing amendments to Iran's succession and divorce laws. She also wanted to withdraw political power from the clergy and advocated the separation of religion and state. Worked to try to change child custody laws in Iran after nine-year-old Aryan Golshani was beaten to death by her father and stepmother. Golshani's mother was not allowed to have custody of her due to Iranian laws that favor men over women. 
After the 1978-79 revolution and the establishment of an Islamic Republic, women were deemed unsuitable to serve as judges because the new leaders believed that Islam forbids it. A body was subsequently forced to become a clerk of the court. After she and other female judges protested this action, they were given higher roles within the Department of Justice but were still not allowed to serve as judges. A body resigned in protest. She then chose to practice law but was initially denied a lawyer's license. In 1992, after years of struggle, she finally obtained a license to practice law and began to do so. Abadi wrote several books on the subject of human rights, including The Rights of the Child, A Study of Legal Aspects of Children's Rights in Iran, 1994, History and Documentation of Human Rights in Iran, 2000, and The Rights of Women, 2002. She also was the founder and head of the Association for Support of Children's Rights in Iran. If you can't eliminate injustice, at least tell everyone about it. Shirin Abadi. Injustice must be fought. Generations are affected by the establishment of true justice in society. Ricky Singh. Tony Morrison. I'm not entangled in shaping my work according to other people's views of how I should have done it. Chloe Anthony Wofford Morrison, born Chloe Ardelia Wofford, February 18, 1931, August 5, 2019, known as Toni Morrison, was an American novelist. Her first novel, The Bluest Eye, was published in 1970. The critically acclaimed Song of Solomon, 1977, brought her national attention and won the National Book Critics Circle Award. In 1988, Morrison won the Pulitzer Prize for Beloved, 1987, she was awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1993. Definitions belong to the definers, not the defined. Toni Morrison If there is a book that you want to read but hasn't been written yet, you must be the one to write it. Toni Morrison Interesting Facts Toni Morrison, born Chloe Ardelia Wofford, 1931 to 2019, was an American novelist, editor, essayist, and professor. Later in life, Morrison would credit her family and her upbringing for having a major influence on her writing style. Morrison has said that when she was growing up, her family was intimate with the supernatural, often using visions and signs to predict the future. Storytelling was also an important tradition in Morrison's family, and Morrison has said she sees herself as carrying on that tradition through her writing. On the experience of writing this first novel, Morrison has said, when I wrote The Bluest Eye, I came at it not as a writer but as a reader. And such a story didn't exist. Every little homely black girl was a joke or didn't exist in literature. And I was eager to read a story where racism hurt and can destroy you. Before she was a celebrated novelist, Toni Morrison was a college professor and an editor. Upon graduating from Cornell, Toni Morrison began teaching English at Texas Southern University, but she later returned to Howard University as a professor. And it was there that Morrison taught Stokely Carmichael, a young civil rights activist. Howard University is also where she met her husband Harold Morrison, a Jamaican architect. Toni Morrison's 1987 novel Beloved is considered by many to be her true masterpiece. The novel follows Seta, a woman who was formerly enslaved. This heartbreaking novel of survival, love, and the supernatural won many awards, including the 1988 Pulitzer Prize for fiction. When there is pain, there are no words. All pain is the same. Toni Morrison. Writing is an art that expresses the writer's vision of the human condition. Ricky Singh. Janet Yellen. If there is a job that you feel passionate about, do what you can to pursue that job. If there is a purpose about which you are passionate, dedicate yourself to that purpose. Janet Louise Yellen, born August 13, 1946, is an American economist, educator, and government official serving as the 78th United States Secretary of the Treasury since January 26, 2021. A member of the Democratic Party, she previously served as the 15th Chair of the Federal Reserve from 2014 to 2018. Yellen is the first woman to hold either role. She is also a professor emeritus at Haas School of Business at the University of California, Berkeley, and formerly a distinguished fellow in residence at the Brookings Institution. A crucial responsibility of any central bank is to control inflation, the average rate of increase in the prices of a broad group of goods and services. Janet Yellen To me, a wise and humane policy is occasionally to let inflation rise even when inflation is running above target. Janet Yellen Interesting facts. Janet Louise Yellen is an American economist and educator. As a member of President Joe Biden's cabinet, Yellen is the first woman to head the U.S. Treasury Department and the Federal Reserve. She is the first person in history to head both of those groups and the White House Council of Economic Advisors. Janet Yellen, at the ripe age of 73 years old, is not new to breaking gender barriers. She, however, 
set the bar up high when she was appointed as the first ever female chair of the United States Federal Reserve, the country's prestigious central banking system. She held the position from 2014 to 2018, after which she was succeeded by Jerome Powell. A respected economist, Yellen is considered to be a dove on monetary policy, more concerned with unemployment than inflation. She generally supports tighter financial regulation. Voted most influential person in the world, 2015. The position of Federal Reserve chairperson will naturally draw a lot of attention from market participants and the general public as decisions made on her watch could lead to economic prosperity or complete turmoil. Yellen oversaw the economic recovery in the years after the global financial crisis when she and the Monetary Policy Committee were tasked with raising interest rates at the appropriate time. Yellen and Akerlof house an impressive stamp collection said to be worth between $15,000 and $50,000. This is according to a financial disclosure form required of Yellen and his public information. The collection is believed to have been passed down by her mother. If it were possible to take interest rates into negative territory, I would be voting for that. Janet Yellen Integrity, knowledge, and excellence are gender-blind. People like Janet Yellen show us that there are no limits for determined young women. Ricky Singh Zaha Hadid I don't think that architecture is only about shelter, is only about a very simple enclosure. It should be able to excite you, to calm you, to make you think. Dame Zaha Muhammad Hadid, October 31, 1950, March 31, 2016, was an Iraqi British architect, artist, and designer, recognized as a major figure in architecture of the late 20th and early 21st centuries. Born in Baghdad, Iraq, Hadid studied mathematics as an undergraduate and then enrolled at the Architectural Association School of Architecture in 1972. In search of an alternative system to traditional architectural drawing, and influenced by suprematism and the Russian avant-garde, Hadid adopted painting as a design tool and abstraction as an investigative principle to reinvestigate the aborted and untested experiments of modernism, to unveil new fields of building. A brilliant design will always benefit from the input of others. Zaha Hadid Education, Housing, and hospitals are the most important things for society. Zaha Hadid Interesting facts. Labeled as the Lady Gaga of architecture, Hadid's infatuation with the design was not only limited to architecture. Her line of shoes was where she could let out all her creative juices without being restrained by the limitations of architectural design. One of her famous shoe designs was known as the Flame. The pair of heels reflected a Zaha-like futuristic appeal reminiscent of parametric forms. Zaha Hadid never stuck to a specific architectural style as she did not want to limit her creativity to a single movement. Early in her career, she drew inspiration from Kazimir Malevich and the Russian art movement suprematism. Hadid was inspired by Malevich's oeuvre, which was characterized by divided geometric patterns and dynamic energy. By pushing the traditional boundaries of architecture, her early works explored the potential for dynamism and distortion, as did Malevich's paintings. Throughout her life, Hadid spoke openly about the misogyny and racism she encountered as a woman of color working in the world of architecture. In the matter, where she had won the international competition to come up with the designs for the Cardiff Bay Opera House, the government had refused to pay for the project in the face of opposition from a handful of local politicians. Zaha Hadid had then also suggested that the resistance may have been linked to her ethnic background as well as her gender. It would have become the most radical and compelling building in Britain, but an alliance of narrow-minded politicians, peevish commentators and assorted dullards holding the lottery purse strings ensured it was never built. The Guardian, on the Cardiff Bay Theatre, of course, I believe imaginative architecture can make a difference in people's lives, but I wish it was possible to divert some of the efforts we put into ambitious museums and galleries into the basic architectural building blocks of society. Zaha Hadid Creating great architectural projects advances societal structures and promotes human growth, across generations. Ricky Singh Catherine Switzer Life is for participating, not for spectating. If you feel positive, you have a sense of hope. If you have hope, you can have courage. Catherine Virginia Switzer, born January 5, 1947, is an American marathon runner, author, and television commentator. In 1967, she became the first woman to run the Boston Marathon as an officially registered competitor. During her run, race manager Jock Semple assaulted Switzer, trying to grab her bib number and stop her from competing. After knocking down Switzer's trainer and fellow runner Arnie Briggs when he tried to protect her, Semple was shoved to the ground by Switzer's boyfriend, Thomas Miller, who was running with her, and she completed the race. If you are losing faith in human nature, go out and watch a marathon. Catherine Switzer I could feel my anger dissipating as the miles went by you can't run and stay mad, Catherine Switzer. 
Interesting facts. She ran Boston eight times, bettering her first time in 1967 of 4 hours 20 minutes down to an eventual 2 hours 51 minutes in 1975. This time then ranked her the third fastest American woman and sixth fastest woman in the world. She ran the New York City Marathon four times and won it in 1974 on a 100 degree day in 307. Catherine Switzer's athletic life began at age 12 when her father encouraged her to run a mile a day to make her high school's field hockey team at James Madison and George C. Marshall High Schools in Vienna, Virginia. She played field hockey and also girls basketball, but continued to run a mile a day as she felt that is what gave her strength and stamina, and also empowerment. After high school graduation, 1964, she began running three miles a day to prepare for the field hockey team at Lynchburg College, in Lynchburg, Virginia. Here she also played women's basketball and lacrosse. In the spring of 1966, she and one of her hockey teammates were asked by the men's track coach to run the mile in 880 for the men's track team. She was very welcomed by all the male runners. This event solidified in her mind that she wanted to run competitively. She also competed at this time in several AAU, Amateur Athletic Union, the then governing body of the sport, competitions, in the longest available events for women, which were the 440 and 880 yards. Often, she would have to run the 220, as that was the only event available in the women's competitions. Lacking natural speed, she was frustrated that these races were not long enough for her abilities. Catherine Switzer has long been one of the most iconic figures. Not just for breaking barriers as the first woman to officially run the Boston Marathon in 1967, but also for creating positive global social change. Because of her millions of women are now empowered by the simple act of running. All you need is the courage to believe in yourself and put one foot in front of the other. Catherine Switzer running is a full body workout. It requires strength, harmonization, and willpower. Ricky Singh About the author Mr. Ricky Singh was born in New Delhi, India on July 28, 1969 as the oldest of three children, i.e., two sisters and Ricky. Immigrated to the United States in 1988, Ricky purchased his first business in 1992 and has not looked back since that time. He has diverse business experiences and expertise, running convenience stores, gas stations, 7-Elevens, tobacco stores, technology startups, restaurants, delis, and other food establishments. Accomplishments include the following. A. Successful serial entrepreneur. B. Owner of all speedy gas stations in Delaware. C. Completed 52 marathons in 50 states. D. Ultra-endurance athlete, running multiple distances, ranging from 5K to 135 miles. E. Climbed multiple peaks including Mount Manasalu, 8th highest point, and Mount Everest. F. Third Indian American and first American Sikh to summit Mount Everest. G. Passionate philanthropist, interested in human upliftment. H. Motivational speaker in diverse settings. Mr. Singh is a loving father with two children, is dedicated to married life with his wife, and believes firmly in taking care of his parents. His mother lives with him in their home in Wilmington, Delaware. 